Justin Trudeau rallies Liberal supporters in Ottawa. Jagmeet Singh shares some numbers for the NDP platform. And Elizabeth May speaks about climate change and global affairs. It's time to have your say. I'm Mark Sutcliffe. Thank you for joining us on CPAC. After last night's final debate of the election campaign, the party leaders have resumed campaigning today, traveling far and wide across the country. It was one month ago today that the campaign was officially launched. Now, with 10 days left until the results are announced, all of the party leaders are expected to maintain busy schedules and do everything they can to attract voters in the final days of the campaign. And advance voting has already begun today and will continue through the weekend. Today, we are asking you, who has momentum heading into the final stretch of the campaign? If you have a comment, call us at 1-877-296-2722 or tweet us at CPAC underscore TV. You can also send us an email at haveyoursay at cpac.ca. Joining us today for our discussion are Theo Argitas, who is Ottawa Bureau Chief for Bloomberg News, and Melanie Marquis, parliamentary reporter for La Presse. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for having us. Let me put that question to both of you. Melanie, who do you think has momentum now? I would say, uh, firstly, <clears throat> Jagmeet Singh. Uh, nationally, he's been doing very well in the debates. He's been posi positioning himself as an alternative between Andrew Scheer and Justin Trudeau, been saying, why choose between which one's worse th th than the other. Right. And then, um, but if that is going to translate in seats, uh, I think it's a big question, perhaps in British Columbia, perhaps a bit in Ontario, but they're not yet in the paying zone, as the pollsters uh, like to say. And um, Yves-François Blanchet in Quebec, who's been... Um, uh, who's been having a surge in the uh, in the polls? It was unexpected. He, you know, the first three weeks he was campaigning, nobody was really minding him, and then it turns out he might uh, he might be second. He might be neck to neck. Well, the Bloc Québécois might be neck to neck with the Liberals, and that is a threat to the Liberals for um, as as much as for the Conservatives who were betting on the province to make uh, some uh, to gain some seats right. as well so i i'd say uh, singh and uh, blanchet okay would you agree theo um uh, i would say definitely blanchet um clearly um <clears throat> statistic statistically speaking um he's the one who's had a, a big bump in the in the poll numbers uh, at least 10 percentage points in quebec since the beginning of the um, of the campaign um you know i think that's a situation where quebecers are taking a look at the options available, the federal options, and kind of deciding they don't like any of them, and you know, going to an old friend in, in the block. Um, in terms of Singh, I think that uh, definitely there's kind of a air in the wings of the NDP. I don't know if the polls are showing that he, the, the NDP or Singh really have uh, momentum. Um, I think uh, Singh has done a really good job at consolidating support um, of his base supporters. He's uh, produce a really solid leftist <coughs> platform, um, you know, twice as much spending as liberals, um, raising revenue from the wealthy. Um, so I think uh, they learned from 2015 where the, when liberals outflank the NDP on the left. Mm. Um, and for the other two uh, leaders, for, um, for Trudeau and for uh, Scheer, I think it's kind of the same old story it's been since the beginning of the campaign, just a flatlining of support. I think they have also consolidated support uh, among their base, uh, but they haven't been able to build it beyond that. Yeah. But here's what's interesting. If, if we'd said a month ago that we'd be asking this question today and that the answer would be Yves-François Blanc Yves Blanchet and Jagmeet Singh, nobody would have believed us, right? That's why we don't like to make predictions, yes. right? Isn't it? And that's it? why we have election campaigns. That's why you have it. Yeah. yeah. yeah you know, when we say campaign, campaigns matter, yeah. they, they do. And um, Yves-François Blanchet has proven to be a very... Well, we knew in Quebec he had this reputation yeah. as being a goon, uh, essentially. And we know how uh, combative he is. But uh, remember, it, it's not even been a year since he took helm of the party, right? right? And the party was in shambles. You remember the whole Martin Ouellet fiasco. 
and it was it, it was uh, a bit hard to imagine uh, yeah. because especially well, in Quebec, which is his only um, you know um, field, um, the Liberals were riding high in the polls, and it was pretty much a given that Justin Trudeau would keep the seats of 40 seats he had uh, over there in 2015 and so you're right that nobody would would have said that I certainly would have wouldn't have said launch a month ago to be honest yeah and uh, a year ago Theo I think the bigger question was whether Jagmeet Singh would even make it to this election campaign let alone be surging during the campaign right yeah you know I think the one thing that you prob probably could have predicted uh, at the beginning of the campaign is the, there would be more fragmented, par fragmented parliament, that the smaller parties would have done better than they did in, in 2015, only because when you look at the approval ratings of the two main leaders, uh, Andrew Scheer and Justin Trudeau, I mean, they, they're both running with very negative approval ratings. Right. Um, and that's fueled a lot of negativity because, you know, what do le unpopular leaders do? Well, they, you know, they try to pull the other uh, leader down. You know, you think I'm, I'm bad, uh, or you don't like me, check out this guy, this right? Guy. So what happens when the electorate don't like, you know, the two main leaders on offer? Well, they look elsewhere, and and so I think that, um, you know, you know, uh, in, no one was predicting the block with, you know, 30 seats in Quebec. But I think, um, you know, maybe um, you you could have seen the block doing better certainly than they did in 2015. Um, and in the NDP, I mean, the expectations were so low for, for Singh. I mean, people, it was more of a leadership thing as well for mm -hmm. Singh. People weren't sure what type of leader he would be and whether he, you know, he could really run a campaign like this. And I think he's exceeded expectations mm -hmm. as well. So I think that's part of the explanation uh, with, uh, with Singh is mm -hmm. that the, expect the expectations, sorry, the thing with Singh was that the expectations right. are so low that he's exceeded those expectations. Yeah. So. Good, yeah. Great debates. And he seems to have the fun campaigning, right? He seems to be enjoying it. Right. Just like Justin Trudeau was in 2015, very much more positive, uh, you, you know, in contrast with Stephen Harper's campaign. So, yeah, he's done a good job. He's exceeded expectations. Like now, if you were to draw a distinction between uh, the fortunes of Blanchette and Singh, would it be this that uh, Blanchette's success is likely to translate into more votes and more seats? Singh, who knows, right? It could be that there are a lot of Canadians who say. I'm really impressed with Jagmeet Singh. I think he's run a terrific campaign. Really like the guy. Mm. Not voting for his party, but I really like the guy. Mm. Is it possible that there could be that dynamic, that he could actually win a lot of people's admiration, but not their support? And uh, not enough um, efficiency right. in the vote, not enough concentration. Yeah. I think what he will, I think his personality uh, popularity has risen. Uh, he's been. Um, He's proven on wild campaigning that he is an option, and I think he might uh, get some people uh, who were thinking of voting green back in the NDP. Right. But then again, the question is, will it translate in seats? Um, it's it's un it's still yeah. unclear. Uh, whereas for Blanchet, it's pretty much right. he's he's going to get more seats. That's and I guess, I guess it also depends on what you compare it to. If you compare uh, the outcome of this election to what the NDP had last time, it's going to look like a loss for the NDP. If you compare it to where the NDP might have ended up in this election, if things had not gone well mm -hmm. during the campaign, where they might have been relegated to fourth or even fifth place mm -hmm. with the Bloc Québécois rising, maybe it won't be so bad, right? Mm. Uh, Theo, what do you think? Does it, does it necessarily follow that if Jagmeet Singh is getting more respect, that he gets more votes and more seats, or are the two well, things maybe not connected? I mean, where the NDP is vulnerable is the the you know the the um, assertion that if you vote NDP, uh, that you're essentially voting for a conservative government. So that is the thing that the NDP um, you know uh, fight against, particularly at the end of, of a campaign. This is the liberal tactic especially when they think they, they really need to go hard and it's a close race, they'll kind of try to convince left-wing voters that, you know, putting your vote with the NDP is not um, the best thing to do because you're going to get a conservative government. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but again, I think um, this is why I think the NDP uh, platform, the NDP campaign uh, on economic issues um, as well as uh, social issues has been such a very much a, a left-wing campaign that it actually helps him consolidate uh, his support and and uh, you know there are some things there that I think are very um, appealing to to left-wing voters and 
you know, maybe the vote will be this time that, uh, you know, maybe a NDP um, kind of kingmaker and a uh, minority parliament is the best way for the left wing vote to go. So, but they are vulnerable to that. Yeah. Uh, to that um, yeah. issue. Yeah, elections are often portrayed as a as a consensus of of the voters that, that we all got together and and figured out what we wanted. For example, sometimes when there's a minority parliament, uh, the leaders will say, or even pundits and and journalists will say afterwards, Canadians wanted a minority government. It's actually that's actually not the way it works. Uh, it's the net result of a whole bunch of individual decisions, some of which are in direct conflict with each other. You can have. Uh, thirty percent of people wanting a liberal majority, thirty percent of people wanting a conservative majority, and and it all adds up to a minority parliament. So, uh, but if it starts to look like there's a minority that's coming, does that help Jagmeet Singh? Does that help Elizabeth May? Does it help Yves Francois Blanchet that there will be voters who will then say, well, I don't need to pick between the conservatives and the liberals. Uh, if it was headed towards a majority, that might have more of a polarizing effect around those two parties. Maybe. Some of the other parties, uh, especially with the tactics they're using now, Elizabeth May yeah. saying in the English debate, you know, uh, God help us if you get a majority, you know, Andrew Scheer, you're not going to be prime minister. The Green Party is going to be a voice in this parliament. Jagmeet Singh yesterday laying out his conditions for supporting uh, other parties in a minority parliament situation. Does it help them perhaps uh, a little bit that some voters will say, okay, if it is going to be a minority parliament, I'll vote for the party I like most? That's a good question, Mark. I, I, I feel as though people will be, um, some people might want to make sure the party they dislike the most doesn't get into office because right. minority government means either the conservatives or the liberals uh, will get into power, most probably. So th in my opinion, it, d does it help them? It's a good question, which I find pollsters maybe could answer you. But I've, I feel as though people um, in the perspective of a minority government will try and make a choice for the, you know, for the party they don't want to get right. in office. But I guess what Jagmeet Singh is hoping is I, that is that the the people who would have voted for the Liberals to yes. stop J Andrew Scheer from getting a majority, mm. if they think, okay, well, it's going to be a minority anyway, then I can vote for the NDP because then I know the Conservatives won't end up in power, I, right? Mm. Yeah, I think it works best when uh, the strategic voting argument works best when um, there is uh, the possibility that the Conservatives could form a majority. So we saw that right. in uh, 2006, for example. Um, I think it doesn't work uh, as well if you know no one believes the Conservatives will get a majority, and I think the likelihood of the, the Conservatives getting a majority are relatively low in this particular case. The path towards 170 seats for the Conservatives is a tough one, uh, and I think in in those situations, um, you know, you'd see less strategic voting because, you know, uh, if you're an NDP uh, voter, um, even a, you know, Conservative minority government is not um, a strong, you know. Government. I mean, they just right. can't do well, things might that you might do, right? It, they might, might, they might win the most right. seats, yeah, yeah. but they might not yeah, get to govern. Exactly. So, yeah. so, so by that you mean the NDP might surrender fewer vote, strategic votes to the that's Liberals, right? right? Because it's not, it, in this election, it's not a question of stopping a conservative majority. It's yeah. a question of whether to give um, you know Liberals another mm -hmm. majority. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Melanie, I wanted to hear from you on the debate last night. What did you think? Uh, I think the consensus is that it was an improvement over the English debate, at it least was. in format and, and let's say, um, decorum. We could hear what the leaders had to say, <laughs> actually. That's an interesting um, concept. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, I would say, it was uh, after an hour and a half, uh, there weren't any, you know, lively exchanges, fiery exchanges. Uh, when it did happen um, is when the um, Andrew Scheer and Yves-François Blanchet started discussing. So Andrew Scheer told Mr. Blanchet he had a secret agenda. He is now pretending to be uh, Quebec Premier's uh, François Legault's best friend. Whereas right after the election, he's going to start working on you know sovereignty with the Parti Québécois. And that led to an interesting exchange between the two. Um, so most of all, um, 
it, it, it was a really good format. Uh, the uh, Patrice Roy, the moderator, did a good job. The questions from the journalists as well were interesting. And it was really, uh, even though it's a national debate, what I found it was uh, is uh, that it was really more about Quebec. Um, right. Really more about trying to get Quebec votes. Uh, Mr. Trudeau t telling people, um, you know, if you vote for uh, the Bloc Québécois, you might, or he said rather, he said, remember in 2015 when Quebecers, you voted for a lot of liberal um, candidates. See what happened? We got Stephen Harper out. So let's just rally around, you know, rally up together and just vote liberal uh, again and not vote bloc because uh, this will actually help, yeah. help the uh, conservatives. So, yeah. Was what was your assessment of the debate, Theo? I thought the, the debate uh, last night was uh, the best of the, of the bunch. Um, I think throughout the, the four debates, I mean, I know uh, I mean, we cover politics closely, so we are familiar with, with policies and that sort of thing. And for many Canadians, it's you know their first or only opportunity to, to hear the, 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 the leaders. But uh, they largely stuck to kind of their talking points uh, throughout the four debates and uh, you know promoted their, their narratives and that sort of thing. I, never, I didn't get a sense that any of the debates produced um, certainly no knockout punches or anything like that. Um, you know, I think they just, uh, because they understand that this is, you know, for many um, Canadians or, and Quebecers, it's the only opportunity they'll, they'll have to, to speak to them. They just largely stick to their narratives. And I know there's, there are moments of drama and, and, and shouting at each other and that sort of thing, but I didn't really hear anything that I hadn't heard before. Um, so, but as far as television is concerned and, and, and kind of some, you know, just more pleasant to listen to or watch uh, <laughs> last night was good. I don't know what the numbers uh, were last night. The Canadians were playing last night uh, right. <laughs> uh, in, Mo in Montreal, home opener. Uh, so uh, I'd be interested to see yeah. how many Quebecers actually watched last okay. night. Yeah. Melanie, does it, uh, is it a given that if the Bloc Québécois is rising and they pass a certain threshold that that makes it almost impossible for anybody to get a majority? It is. Or, or it reduces the likelihood significantly, be, let's be, say. Because of um, the odds, uh, there is a, a, a really um, hard-fought battle in Toronto and the GTA, which the, the Liberals last time around pretty much sweeped, right, remember? Yeah. Uh, the Liberals won't get all 32 seats in Atlantic like they did in 2015. And without, if they, they go down uh, the number of seats, I mean, 40 seats for Quebec out of 70, 78 in 2015 was pretty impressive. So, indeed, if the Bloc or, you know, any other party as well, the, the Conservatives might get grab a couple of seats here and there, um, the NDP not so much. But for sure, for the Liberals, uh, the Bloc surge is a very threatening uh, concept, yeah. especially in the last leg of the campaign, right? Yeah. All right, let's see what some of our viewers think. We are very interested in your opinions on who has momentum going into the final 10 days of the campaign or on any other topic arising from the election campaign so far. It's now 30 days old. Give us a call right now. Share your comments with us on social media or email us at haveyoursay at cpac.ca. Let's take a call from Cami in Sydney, Nova Scotia. Hello, Cami. Hi, how are Hi. you today, Mark? Good, thank you. And your guests, I think Melanie just made a mistake. She better watch Quebec with Justin Singh. He's gaining them a lot of lament over there. She said the NDP, not so much. I don't agree with her. Okay. Anyway, so you think, do you think the NDP has some momentum in Quebec? Yes. My gosh, yes. I don't okay. know where she's been. Um, sorry. I think she's been in Quebec. I think he's the, he's the strongest leader, Jasmine Singh. He's the most honest. The only thing that's going to change with your Liberals and Tory is the color you're going to get, blue or red. So anyway, thanks for taking my call, Mark, and your guests I enjoy. But, Melody, I still like you. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> All right, Cammy, thank you. Pamela is in uh, Salt Spring Island, British Columbia. Hello, Pamela. Hello. Hi. Go ahead. Hi, I'm just very concerned about the vaping crisis that we've got going on in this country concerning so many young Canadians using these vaping products, including THC marijuana products. And I don't know why it is that none of these federal leaders can take it upon themselves to realize that this is a crisis, even though we're in an election. We've got 26 dead kids in America. 
how long is it going to be before we have a Canadian death? And is it going to really take that for them to pay attention to what the scientists are saying and what the scientists told this Liberal government um, back when they were looking at this bill on how to better protect Canadians? So I'm just very... Um, concerned that, you know, politics is taking a precedence over public health. What specifically would you like to see happen? There needs to be a moratorium on these products, just like the CDC in America put out an advisory warning uh, two weeks ago and said, everybody out there, stop using these things, especially if they're THC, until we figure out what it is that's killing all these kids and also causing all of these lung, you know, problems that, right. you know, maybe kids aren't dying from it, but they're certainly being hospitalized. Yeah, there have been, I think, 1,800 illnesses tied to vaping in the United States. Uh, I don't that's have the latest good. data in Canada, but uh, obviously it's a serious issue. Um, uh, so, and but I mean, this doing is nothing about it. They're not yeah. addressing it, and, and they should be. Like the Physicians for a Smoke-Free Canada, a nonpartisan lead organization in this country about smoking, has told them what to do, how to address this issue, and all of the leaders um, have been very lackluster and and haven't gone along with it. I I, I think that that's I don't know why one of them wouldn't step up and say, let's address this thing. You know, Andrew Scheer should definitely take the lead on this since it's a liberal failure. The liberals brought in incredibly flawed legislation on vaping. And I don't know why Andrew Scheer isn't taking up this, this conversation on behalf of Canadian families. All right, Pamela, thank you for your call. Okay, thanks. Chris in London, Ontario. Hello, Chris. Hi, Mark. Hi. Um, and to your panel. I am... I, in terms of the question, the main question that you're posing, and uh, as far as who has the momentum going into the final final week, yeah, I would say uh, both the Bloc and the NDP, even though uh, Mr. Singh's popularity upswing in popularity hasn't, in the polls thus far, translated into an increase in seats. There's always a delayed reaction to these things, and I think you could see right up until the weekend before the vote, um, you know, a, a significant surge for the NDP in terms of uh, seat count and popular vote. And in, in relation to another aspect of the current situation where it looks like it's going to be a minority, either Tory or Liberal, um, it's it's almost natural that if it's a liberal minority, they will work out an arrangement of some kind, whether formal or informal, with both the Greens and the NDP, simply because of where they the three parties stand on the ideological spectrum. However, should it be that the Conservatives win a minority, I would say that the Bloc are a potential informal partner for them. Because people, at, at first glance, that might seem they might seem like strange bedfellows, but there's two or three issues where there's some common ground that I think they could they could negotiate a fairly sustainable um, arrangement between the two. One of them being more vigilance about the um, illegal border crossing or irregular. Take your pick how you right. want to say it um, at Roxham Road and throughout Canada. But also on provincial autonomy, historically, the Conservatives have been more uh, proponents of more of a decentralized federation, giving the provinces more, more autonomy. And, and also on the um, uh, single tax form that the, Mr. Shearer has been proposing for Quebec income tax filers. So it'll be interesting to see in the last week how it plays out. I mean, I expect the Liberals... Justin to go in hardcore in, in, you know, the liberal fear machine to really ramp up um, to try and scare the progressives into consolidating behind Trudeau. But then on the other hand, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see Scheer making some friendly overtures to Quebec nationalist voters that are considering the bloc, because um, I'm sure it isn't just myself that it's occurred to that, you know, if he makes an appeal to the block, that could solidify things for him. Okay, Chris, thank you very much for your call. Uh, let's pick up on some of those themes. Um, uh, I think it's a, a given that unless Andrew Scheer comes very close to a majority or wins the popular vote by a significant margin, that it's going to be very difficult for him to form a government mm -hmm. uh, in a minority parliament situation. Mm -hmm. Right, I, th I think the Elizabeth May and and um, Jagmeet Singh have already made it pretty clear they would not support him. Right. So that leaves 
the block, like your uh, yeah. the last caller but just said. But the math said, may which, not work in that case, right? The block may not necessarily the math may not work. You have enough seats right. to, to put the conservatives over the top. But on some, uh, on a lot of issues, and the last caller described them very well, they, they do have yep. a lot of common ground. They can work together on a lot of things. Um, and let's not forget the block was, was born out of the progressive conservative exactly, party exactly. going back uh, and 30 years. And so I years. think it, and it's funny because the, um, over a week ago I was uh, in uh, Lisa Raitt's uh, writing, which, you know, she, she's uh, having a hard battle to fight there yeah. against Adam Van Coeverden. And when I asked the, um, about who uh, minority conservative government uh, would, um, could strike a deal with, she, right off the bat, she said, I don't know, how's the blog doing? So mm. that was her first answer, and she, you know, she, she, she wasn't saying that would be the case. But I think the conservatives see more room, you know, see more of a possibility to yeah. work uh, with the the bloc. Yeah, Theo, it's worth pointing out that, uh, uh, and just as a reminder to people of how this all works, you don't win a, ma a minority government, right? Yeah. You you negotiate one effectively after the election, right? So just because one party finishes with the highest number of seats, if they don't have a majority, doesn't mean they're going to govern, right? No, that's right. I mean, the, and the prime minister is the prime minister until he's not. So he gets yeah. the first crack at, at forming a, a, a government or yeah. getting the confidence and the, of the And house. the prime minister is not the leader of the party with the highest number of seats in the House. It's the leader uh, the, the Prime Minister is the leader of the party that has the confidence of that's, the House, right. and that could be anybody. Mm -hmm. So I guess there is a scenario where the Conservatives get a plurality of the seats, but um, right. the, the Liberals are still, um, or the Prime Minister uh, Trudeau is still Prime Minister uh, with the confidence of the House because of support from the NDP or the Greens. Uh, as far as the, the Bloc and, and, and the Conservatives are, are concerned, there is a track record, right, yeah. in 2006 of, um, of that happening. So, um, you know, but I think for the Conservatives to really uh, have a crack at this, I think the gap between the Conservatives and the Liberals has to be wide on the seats. I mean, yeah. I don't think we can, you know, like, um, you know, Conservatives with 140 seats and the Liberals, with, you know, backed by the bloc and the, the Liberals with 137, somehow some type of, you know, um, a situation where um, the Conservatives only have a small lead in the seats, in, in, in seats. Uh, would make it very difficult, I think, yeah. to, to sustain uh, a government where I think it's a lot easier for the Liberals to do that because yeah. they do have. Yeah. Um, and uh, let's keep in mind as well that it, uh, while it does happen from time to time that there is a formal coalition that is struck, it doesn't need to be a formal coalition. No. You can just go issue to issue. Stephen Harper, uh, during the first five or six years that he was prime minister, led a succession of minority uh, conservative governments uh, and, and never had a formal coalition yeah. with any of the opposition parties. He just sort of did it issue by issue, right? right. Yeah, which is something uh, the, like, for instance, the bloc might agree to. Same with the NDP, I think, and the Liberals. They wouldn't give them, like, rubber stamp approval. They would go yeah. case by case. That's what, at least, Alexandre Boudris, the, the um, uh, deputy leader yeah. over in Quebec, and, told. And, and it can be very functional uh, governments as well. This yeah. is not, these are not dysfunctional governments. Um, you know, in 2009, yeah. the Conservative government was minority government, and it, you know, dealt with a great recession, you know, as minority government. Yeah. So these tend to be functional governments yeah. in Canada. Yeah. Uh, by the way, coming up at about 3 o'clock Eastern time, in just over half an hour from now, we are expecting Conservative leader Andrew Scheer to speak on the day that uh, the party's platform is being released, a fully costed platform. So we'll go to that live as soon as it begins right here on CPAC. Let's take a call from Bernadette in Markham, Ontario. Hello, Bernadette. Good afternoon, Mark. Hi. Um, you're asking who you think has the momentum. I think, actually, right now it's probably the Bloc and the NDP. And my prognosis is that it's going to be a minority government. And uh, either way, I'm, I kind of enjoy minority governments because some of the best legislation we ever had came out of minorities. And uh, for me, the only thing that digs up my craw is that somebody like the Bloc can come in from one province, and that's basically what they're representing. And uh, that's a hard thing for me to swallow. And I hope whatever kind of government gets made, that the next time they can do something. So that's not the outcome. Okay, Bernadette, thank you very much for your call. Thank you. Uh, we've talked, Melanie, about uh, the impact of the block on this election. What, what's uh, 
your sense of what their impact would be on the next parliament if they do indeed have a substantial increase in the number of seats? Um, I think they would uh, be very aggressive on the um, tax haven, uh, the combat against tax havens, the immigration as well. Uh, they might want to, um, if the flow of um, asylum seekers continues over uh, in Roxham Road, they might want to press the government on this. Um, but, you know, pretty much standing up to defend Quebec's interests. Uh, yeah. And the environment would, will be uh, a big issue as well. Um, because of, of course, they're against the uh, Trans Mountain, the, um, uh, the, the Liberals buying the Trans Mountain pipeline. But there is a natural gas project over in Quebec in Saguenay as well that might come in and, and it was mentioned actually in yeah. the debate yesterday, that it might come in and kind of put the bloc in a difficult position of saying we don't want the oil from the Alberta, but this project over in Quebec, the BAP approved it, so we're for it. But right. yeah, on these issues. So aside from the issues, Theo, uh, as Bernadette just said, our caller, uh, it, it rankles some people to see the Bloc Québécois do well. The people outside Quebec, that this this um, party who's who's there to defend only Quebec's interests has a presence in the House of Commons and even some clout. Uh, so are there other consequences that could arise out of the rise of the Bloc Québécois? Uh, you know, I, you know, this is, you know, more than 150 years of Canadian history here on, um, you know, um, the relationship between Quebec and the rest of Canada. So, sure. um, you know, I've never seen, um, you know, any province, you can, you know, you, any province can develop their own kind of prov provincial uh, centric party and we haven't seen that. Um, so there is a unique nature there to Quebec uh, that I think most Canadians kind of accept. Um, uh, uh, now, in terms of the bloc, I mean, I think um, there's, you know, there's not a lot really um, that uh, where the bloc and the conservatives can kind of see eye to eye on, especially given the, some of the differences around in the environment. In 2006, there were actually more um, issues where they could agree on because that was the fiscal imbalance kind of yeah. issue, right? So, yeah. um, you know, the, um, the the Harper government essentially gave more money to to Quebec and. Um, through transfers and uh, you know cut the GST and what did the Quebec government do? Well, raise the the the, the uh, PST and so there was more kind of um, things that could unite the bloc and, and the conservatives. This time around, it's going to be a little bit mm -hmm. more difficult and you know single income tax. I don't know. That's you know, right? It's not a lot there. I mean, it's important, yeah. but it's not. Um, yeah. No, it's not. A, no, but but, but yeah. the bloc isn't the political force it used to be. I mean, we're not post referendum, right? This is not 1996. Uh, so the threat of them trying to break up the country, I find, is not the same as it was a couple of decades ago. Mm -hmm. And to which I would argue as well that when you elect an Ontario MP, it's normally it's yeah, to every, represent Ontario interest in yeah. Every Ottawa, representative right? is meant to be local. And, uh, in now, theory. Yeah, the Alberta MPs are supposed to be representing the interests of their local constituents. Mm -hmm. The same with any province in the country or any region in the mm -hmm. country, um, but but it is different when they run under a banner and they block together to use that word block together <laughs> to uh, to uh, promote the interests of one part of the country right. against the others. Right. right. Uh, in, that's how it's viewed by some Canadians and and even the language that's used, like Yves Francois Blanchet in the English language debate, saying. Quebec and the provinces, mm. not Quebec and the other provinces, but Quebec and the provinces, emphasizing the special status of mm. Quebec, right? That's that's not going to go over well in Alberta and B.C. Mm. And, and, and it yeah. never does, but it's yeah. kind of the cost of doing business in yeah. Canada. Right. right. Okay. We are going to get back to your phone calls in just a few minutes. We also, again, have... Uh, uh, Andrew Shear coming up uh, within the next half hour, likely, as the Conservatives unveil their platform, already criticized for doing so late in the campaign and this morning, criticized by Justin Trudeau, the Liberal leader, for doing it uh, late on a Friday before a long weekend, uh, as Justin Trudeau suggesting that you would never release your best work on the Friday before a long weekend. So we'll see what's in the Conservative platform and what Andrew Shear has to say about it coming up here on CPAC. We're going to get the scoop on social media now with CPAC's own social media analyst, Winston C. Hello, Winston. 
Good afternoon, Mark. So let's talk about last night's French language debate. Did people feel like there was a clear winner of the debate last night? Well, it was definitely interesting to analyze the social media of last night over the English language debate from Monday. Uh, one of the points of con uh, consensus, I think, is that there was a sense of civility, and uh, that was definitely reflected in the different messages that uh, were sent, uh, as you can see there. Let's take a look at some of the comments. This is a comment from uh, I am Damon saying, I think the winner of tonight's debate for the election is actually the moderator, very thankful to listen to a civilized debate. Uh, this is a tweet from Ian McCarter, uh, written in French and translated here, saying, uh, it is the first debate I've ever watched where I wanted, uh, rather, where I heard real answers from leaders to real issues. The format is the winner uh, this evening. Uh, this is another one from Say Wait saying, post debate, as far as I'm concerned, if there is a winner, it's Jagmeet Singh. And I think my vote will lean towards the orange side. And another one from 2B underscore like, saying Yves Francois Blanchet, still the winner and by far. He is very strong and deserves Quebec's complete trust. Uh, someone else also ranking the, tw uh, the the winners here, saying that uh, the winner here was uh, Yves Francois Blanchet, followed by Singh, and at the bottom of the list, actually Green Party leader Elizabeth May. So we're seeing stuff from all over, uh, but reflected also in some of the uh, social media where uh, Jagmeet Singh garnering a lot of the conversation. Okay, uh, that's interesting to see that. Uh, uh, now, what about uh, the issues that were discussed in the debate? What was the reaction to that on Twitter? Well, it was really interesting to see what issues did pop up. This is a message from Ken Smith, uh, one person who said it was interesting to see how uh, Liberal leader Justin Trudeau brought up, uh, of course, Ontario Premier Doug Ford uh, brought it up several times, once in the uh, French leaders debate, or rather French uh, language debate, also brought up during the English language debate as well, uh, saying, I think Trudeau should run for Liberal provincial leadership. His dream will come true of debating uh, Doug Ford in the legislature legislature every day. This is another one from uh, Muse and Rants. There is no credible scientist or scientific data that denies the modern day climate crisis. Bernier is fully denying the facts of science and willfully pr uh, propping up pseudoscience and misinformation on a national stage. So climate change being discussed there. Uh, from Joe, uh, the topic of assisted death was brought up tonight and this stood out because each leader was in support of improving the policies currently in place. This may have been the only topic where all leaders agreed. And uh, this, of course, was quite a difficult topic, but was also one that was uh, heavily discussed on uh, social mm -hmm. media as well. And uh, can you give us uh, some thoughts on what Google Trends is telling us about uh, what people are thinking post-debate? Well, we saw a very interesting trend where a couple weeks uh, it was very much a very red country with a couple exceptions of conservative. In terms of what Google search was, this isn't necessarily indicative of support, right. but just what people are searching about. But uh, all throughout the week, we've been talking about Jagmeet Singh and, and how important it is for all of the leaders and how they use these social media moments uh, reflected on how the conversation is had online. Okay, I think we've lost our connection to Winston C. Uh, so, uh, oh, there you are. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, You're back. The internet connection. I am back. I am back. Okay. But uh, this map here showing the uh, interesting trend where uh, Jugmeet Singh uh, definitely took some leadership in provinces like Ontario, Manitoba, Quebec, British Columbia, leading the way in those provinces where it's been a kind of a, a very red and blue. Uh, mm. trend in terms of those provinces. That's, I mean, that suggests momentum because uh, mm -hmm. I know you're, you, you pointed out before when, when there were a lot of searches about Justin Trudeau uh, shortly after the blackface, brownface scandal uh, broke that uh, that didn't necessarily mean it was people uh, who were going to vote for him. But there hasn't been a controversy around Jagmeet Singh. If people are searching uh, for Jagmeet Singh right now, that does sort of suggest that they're trying to learn more about him and that they're seeing him as more relevant in this campaign now than perhaps he was a couple of weeks ago.
Yeah, and relevance so important, especially when it comes to the the younger millennial vote. I was actually near Ryerson University uh, on on Tuesday uh, after the debate where Jagmeet Singh was, and to see droves of students come out to support him, uh, whether that was to take some selfies or whether that was just to kind of capture uh, that moment was definitely interesting. Is he resonating with the younger voters, especially with advanced polling uh, this weekend? Yeah. All right, good stuff, Winston. Thank you for joining us once again today. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. To you too. Winston C., CPAC's social media analyst. Now, Theo, I know you focus in particular on economic issues. Uh, we're expecting the Conservative uh, Party's fully costed platform to be released a little bit uh, later, uh, within the next half hour perhaps. Uh, how important is this? Uh, because it, it, uh, we've, we've seen a lot of emphasis on it in this campaign. And of course, there's a uh, facility there available to the parties to have their platforms costed by the Parliamentary Budget Office uh, in a way that did not exist before in previous campaigns. But at the same time, nobody's promising to balance the books anytime soon, apart from the People's Party of Canada, who I think have said they'd do it within two years. Um, so it, are these fully costed platforms really that significant? I think um, it, it imposes discipline on the parties. I mean, they have to explain how they're going to pay for all these promises. So, for example, the Liberals, um, who have maybe around $15, $16 billion worth of new spending, had to acknowledge that they're going to have to run higher deficits. So this is uh, what we're waiting to see here in the Conservative platform. We know that they've said that they plan to balance the budget over five years, I think. Yeah. Um, what we don't know is how they're going to do this. So today what we're looking at is, you know, where are they going to find the money for their promises? Their, their, their spending and tax measures aren't as high as the other parties, but they're still significant. Um, and whether those uh, measures are credible. So it, they are important because it imposes discipline on, on the parties to actually show how they're going to essentially, you know, run budgets in mm -hmm. the future, right? Right. You know, are we moving out of, though, and are, are we permanently out of an era where you had to balance the budget or have a plan to do so pretty soon? Yeah, I think um, uh, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau broke that taboo in 2015. Um, and not only did uh, he break uh, that taboo explicitly uh, in, the, in that campaign, but then when he came to power, ran much larger deficits than he, yeah. he would um, yeah. anyway. And he, obviously they felt that it wasn't uh, something that... Uh, would hurt them that much politically. I mean, I'm sure all this stuff is, you know, focus group tested and everything. Hmm. And not only did they run larger deficits while in government, now they're doubling down with even larger deficits. So, I mean, as, you know, uh, clearly the Liberals think, certainly to the people that they're talking to and the voters that they think that they can attract, this doesn't matter as much. I think it matters more to conservative voters. And I think uh, the people who are more likely to vote conservative are more worried about this. So that's why I think uh, the Conservatives are compelled to, at the very least, have some type of, um, you mm -hmm. know, trajectory that brings them back to balance. Mm -hmm. So and it's two different types of voters that sure. they're speaking yeah. to. Uh, and what do you think about that? Uh, not so much from a political perspective, but from the perspective of uh, the country's economic health. There are people who are saying uh, that uh, while the debt-to-GDP ratio is dropping slowly, as Justin Trudeau has pointed out, and that, that as long as we stay within a certain range, it's not the end of the world, it's acceptable debt. Um, but there are others saying, hey, if we suddenly fall into a recession and the deficits get even larger, uh, we could be in some real trouble. Yeah, I think you just described the two sides of that debate pretty well. I mean, there are people who will argue that it's, you know, Canada's uh, debt uh, ratio is not that, that high. Certainly the federal government is not that, that high. And there is scope to uh, to run deficits and do more, particularly particularly at a time when you know people are running have a high debt level, so the government kind of can can do more to get the economy going. Um, now there are others who are saying, okay, fine, if you're running deficits when times are good, relatively good, what happens when we do get into a recession and don't we want to have this reserve down the line? And you know that is that's one of the themes that is actually not being discussed in you know in this yeah. election. Uh, there are a lot of concerns. We're headed into uh, the sharp global economic slowdown, possibly even a recession. So those deficits of 27 billion next year that the the the, the uh, liberals are talking about, and um, I think it's more than 30 billion for the NDP. If we're in a recession next year, that's going to be 40 billion and 60 billion. You know, I mean, yeah. so uh, so there. I mean, I you know there are merits to both arguments, um, and um, so I. 
you know, it depends on which side. You're not side. picking sides? You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I look at it objectively. I can see, I can see uh, the merits of both, both arguments. Right. Melanie, how do you think this goes over in, in the public? Uh, once uh, I, there was a collective gasp when Justin Trudeau said in 2015, I'm going to run $10 billion deficits for three years and then balance the books. People thought it was the end of his campaign. Yeah. He ended up becoming prime minister with a majority government. So uh, maybe that's all we need to know about this. And then they never backed away when they were yeah. in government. Uh, Bill Morneau, the finance minister, and Justin Trudeau certainly had no issue, um, you know, bringing even higher deficits. And now, like Theo said there, it's even bigger uh, in their uh, what they're promising. Um, I think that the what's going what what is good for the liberals right now is that the economy is uh, in very good shape. Uh, but I agree with the Theo that there is um, there are signs that um, downturn or recession might uh, be coming. But what is interesting is that for a, a segment of the population, since the economy is going, since we're you know in a full job creation, even there's a problem with the um, lack of uh, um, uh, so, sorry about that in Quebec, so not enough workers. Yes. So, um, Labor shortage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sorry. And then, uh, so there is the argument that liberals are in a good position to say our plan's been working, but what is interesting is that it hasn't been discussed. It was a big theme on the last election, and then the NDP doesn't seem to have no. a big problem with the deficits, and yeah, so. Okay, let's take a call from Daniel in Two Mountains, Quebec. Hello, Daniel. Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so my point I wanted to make was that we've been hearing a lot, uh, we've been uh, hearing a lot of talk about the Bloc and the Conservatives getting together, but I think it's important to remind everyone that. The, the main base of the conservatives is in Alberta. So if they want to keep it, they have to deliver on that pipeline promise. And we know that the bloc is not going to allow any pipeline to be built over Quebec. And th that's one of the main promises of the conservatives. So maybe maybe they're going to promise that on the second year, the third, maybe to delay it. But I think that's going to be a point where there's going to be maybe a bit of a fight. Uh, also, another point I want to make, uh, I disagree a bit with Melanie. Even even if the bloc was really strong during the referendum period and maybe after the referendum, it started to, to to really go down once the liberals were in power in Quebec, the Quebec Liberal Party. But now it's starting uh, to grow again, not because of any separation issue, but mostly because of the nationalistic issue in Quebec. So I think that's something that the bloc could use maybe to further their position in Quebec and maybe promote separatism later by showing that uh, Canada doesn't want any nationalism from Quebec. Uh, and the last point I also want to make, uh, I don't know if you've seen the CBC poll tracker this morning, but it was a really, really interesting result that they had. They had 170 seats for the Tories, the Bloc and the PPC and 168 for the Liberals, the NDP, and the Greens. So that's going to be hmm. uh, a hist historical election, if I might say. If, yeah. if I can speak to the TMX issue. Sure. Uh, I mean, uh, you, uh, the um, caller, Daniel, uh, uh, I think he's right. They obviously don't see eye on, eye on the environment. But you don't need the legislation. So, um, and it, it's the same thing if the Liberals um, have to form a government with support of the NDP or the Greens. You don't need legislation for that. So that's you know, something that you can get done without having a vote uh, right. in Parliament. That's a good point. All right, Danielle, thank you for your call. Uh, let's take a look at what people have been saying on social media. Please use the hashtag CPACVote2019 when you are sharing your comments. This person writes, I would say the NDP have momentum throughout Canada, and both NDP and Liberals have momentum in Quebec. Dare I predict a minority Liberal government with the NDP holding the balance of power? Another uh, comment on Twitter. Even less than a month ago, as the election campaign started, Jagmeet Singh and the NDP were written off by most media outlets. He now has all the momentum with a week and a half to go. Rod writes, I can't remember an election where there has been so little movement in the polls, no momentum or enthusiasm for anyone. Bizarre. One proud Canadian writes, today 
Another three co-workers mentioned to me that they'll be voting for, the, uh, for Jagmeet Singh and the NDP. Two of these people were Liberal Party voters last election and one was Green. I can't help but think the NDP is building momentum in the last two weeks. That's Mr. Neal writes, Jagmeet Singh's momentum is nothing but a concept created by conservative pundits and journalists to distract from the horrible uh, debate and campaign performance of Andrew Scheer. All right. Appreciate all of those comments. Keep them coming. Again, the hashtag is CPACVote2019. Bill in St. Catharines, Ontario. Hello. Hello, Mark. Hi. I know you told me to call you after the election. If I was right or wrong about the uh, prediction I gave you right. on the sixth day of the election, remember that? Yeah, I think you predicted a conservative government, right? That's right. Yeah. What I'm calling about is how can Singh uh, uh, help another party? Like, he's, he's against the pipeline. He's against the uh, carbon tax. And then he wants to tax big corporations. Now, we lost John Deere. We lost GM. And if he keep taxing these big companies, I can protect you in a year or two. We're going to lose Ford. Because big company, if you can't sell your uh, resource, how is any big company come to Canada for business if we can't sell our resources? And I guarantee you, he taxed because when you tax a big company... Yeah, it doesn't... Just to be clear, Bill, if, if the NDP supports another party that has more seats than it in the House of Commons, uh, it doesn't mean the entire NDP platform gets adopted by that party. They'll have to look at no, it no, issue by how issue. Could work, how could they work with them if they don't believe in the pipeline or uh, carbon tax? And don't forget, these companies, if they got to pay more tax, every three or four years... The darn union is after them for more money for their employers. Come on, you can't do it. Okay, Bill, thank you for your call. Uh, I mean, obviously, this is the stage of the campaign, Melanie, where everybody stakes out very clear positions. They dig in their heels. They're strident about their views. But if there's a minority parliament, people are going to have to sit down and work things out and make mm -hmm. compromises, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's what the situation dictates. Unless mm -hmm. they want another election, and none of them can afford that. And... I mean, they, they, they have been discussing this uh, after the debate uh, yesterday. It was, um, there were a lot of questions from the media on, on that issue, and they are starting to contemplate that idea. There is no um, uh, concept or, or project of forming a coalition, but definitely the parties are starting to think that, that they might want to, they might have to work with the, right. each other to make it work, to make the parliament work, right? Theo, we're standing by for Andrew Shear's unveiling of his platform. Uh, what, what will you be watching for in that platform? Well, uh, I'll be watching for uh, assuming that he, he still plans to balance the budget in five years. I'll be watching for how he plans to, to do that. How is he going to uh, raise the revenue what, uh, and whether those, um, those um, revenues, um, you know, whether that plan is a credible one. And, you know, and... We'll judge after uh, after we see that. Yeah. Or he's going to cut as well, because he, right. he said there will be no big cuts, um, the, uh, well, other than the 25% out of foreign aid, mm. uh, the infrastructure bank, the Asian bank as well. So, But we'll see. Their mm. devil is in the details, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. They will be signaling uh, clearly that they, you know, they, are the, they are the budget balancing mm -hmm. party, right? Mm. All right. Theo, Melanie, thank you so much for joining us today. Appreciate it. Happy Thanksgiving to both of you as well. You too. Uh, we are waiting on the announcement from, from Conservative leader Andrew Scheer unveiling the party's election platform within the next few minutes. As we wait on that, our question to you is what should be in the Conservative platform? We welcome your thoughts on that. You can call us at 1-877-296-2722 or send us a comment online using the hashtag CPACVote2019. Let's take a closer look now at what voters across the country say matters to them in this election. I'm kind of more liberal, I would say, but I get kind of nervous with voting just because I get like, 
I don't know, like with Trudeau when I voted for him, I was really like excited about it and I thought it was going to go great and then it didn't go that great in my opinion, right? So now I'm kind of, I get kind of hesitant. I have to do like a lot of research and whatnot, right? So, but I'm going to vote and <laughs> hopefully it makes a difference a little bit. In general terms? Yes. I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, I thought Trudeau, I don't dislike him, but I thought he was a little bit hypocritical with all that recent scandal that came out, you know? Um, but on the other hand, I think the conservative guy is going to be a bit more ruthless when it comes to pensions and stuff like that. I'm frightened he's going to raise it, raise it to beyond 65. So, and also I like the NDP guy as well. So I'm a little undecided to be honest with you. I, I just don't know. I'm not too keen on any of them if you really want to know the truth. <laughs>
prov other provinces, for example, would support a similar type of legislation in their own province. And I think, I mean, if that's not something we should stand up against, I don't know what will be. And I don't necessarily think it's up to the courts to decide. Uh, of course, logistically and legally it will be, but it's, it's our civic duty to discuss that bill, right? It's our civic duty to discuss what exactly that bill will mean for us. Uh, whether or not that bill will have a trickle-down effect from the public sector into the private sector. You see, you hear a lot about the, the MPs in our area when elections come, but where are they throughout the year? Um, uh, very few you see actively in the public, um, getting involved, engaging with the public. It's great uh, a lot of the MPs came on campus, but they weren't here throughout the, the rest of the year. It's time once again to have your say on CPAC. I'm Mark Sutcliffe. Thank you for joining us today. We're waiting on an announcement from Conservative leader Andrew Scheer. He's expected to unveil the party's election platform within minutes. And in this part of the program, we're asking what should be in the Conservative platform. Uh, we're interested in your opinions on that, so please call us at 1-877-296-2722 or tweet us at CPAC underscore TV. Use the hashtag CPACVote2019. You can also send us an email at haveyoursay at cpac.ca. Joining us for this part of the program are Bill Curry, journalist with The Globe and Mail, and Kim McRail, a reporter with The Wall Street Journal. Welcome to both of you. Thanks. Thanks it's time for Andrew Shear's fully costed platform, Kim. What do you expect in this? What do you think uh, the importance of it is to the conservative campaign? It's been talked about a lot, mostly by Andrew Shear's opponents. It has, yeah, and uh, it's they've, they've definitely waited. They took their time getting it out and really this is as late as they could be before our advance polls open. Um, and I think it will give his uh, Andrew Shear's opponents an opportunity to look at where he's actually going to find the money that he he will need to make the pro to meet some of the promises he's made um, for some of the spending and also he plans to balance the budget within five years he says. So, so where is that money coming from and that's that's what we'll be looking for. Yeah. Bill, how important do you think this is? Well, it's, I mean, that's obviously, a, you know, the platform is your core presentation right. to voters, so it's its very important. So it's, it's but it's not like he here. hasn't said what he's going to do throughout the campaign, right? This is, this is bringing it all together in one document and attaching some costing to it. It's not the unveiling of a whole bunch of brand new promises. Yes, but the issue was uh, there was a gap in what he's been saying along the road and the numbers, right? He's been yeah. making promises all along. Uh, he's also said that he's going to balance the budget, and people who have been tallying those promises have said, uh, you know, there's roughly about a $15 billion gap that he's got to, got to explain somehow. So um, we're in a bit of an awkward situation here in that we've got the platform here. We've read it. It's under embargo. We can talk right. about it once Shear starts talking. So there are things, there are some surprises in terms of where the, uh, the money comes from, which we can get into uh, later. But yeah. uh, it's, there's, it's, uh, it's something that's going to drive conversation for throughout the weekend and the next week, I think. Why do you think it's being released today? Uh, Liberal leader Justin Trudeau this morning implied that uh, it, it obviously wasn't Andrew Scheer's best work if it was coming out uh, Friday afternoon before a long weekend. Well, I mean, it's just so much easier to talk about things you're going to do for people versus things you're going to cut. And uh, so, I mean, that's, that's the challenge. Uh, the NDP did it as well this morning. They released their platform today. So that means uh, for both of those leaders, they were not able, they didn't get questions, specific questions about uh, how they're going to pay for their platform because it came out today and the last debate was last night. Yeah. Kim, uh, do you think this is the kind of thing that uh, gets fed into the, uh, the mill of, of Canadian politics uh, at, the, at the leadership, at the campaign level, or is it something that trickles down to Canadians and affects how they will vote? Uh, so I think I think some Canadians will think I, I mean I think there's maybe two parts of that there's the timing of the release of the platforms right. and some Canadians might think you know I'm, I'm a little frustrated that I'm not seeing what is behind these promises until right before election day and right before the advance polls um, and then in terms of what's actually in there it's it, 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 I, it may be tough for people to, you know, platforms are not something a lot of people sit down and read through in a lot of detail before they make their decision. And so when people spend their weekend having Thanksgiving dinner with their families, whether or not, you know, the very specifics of what's in that platform come up is, it, it, it might not. It might not get the attention and, and that it would have if it could, yeah. had come out earlier. 
Bill, in an era where uh, it's not as important to have balanced budgets as it was 20 years ago, uh, is a fully costed platform less important? I think what it does is that uh, there's a little less attention on the details. It's kind of funny, just five years ago you would have had you know, the liberal finance critic uh, attacking the Conservatives for being you know, a little bit over their or off their deficit targets right. and, and we go after the minutia of things that might be a fifty million dollar entry and now we're in... That's you know, right. It would, it would, yeah. If you, you said there was going to be a three billion dollar deficit yeah, exactly. and there's a four billion dollar deficit which sounds like it's thirty three percent more but on of course it's a it's a minor difference, a minor variation uh, when you consider the scope of the Canadian yeah, budget. Yeah, for a year Scott Bryson, the liberal finance critic, was going bonkers over those every time the deficit numbers came out yeah. and then in power they had no problem with deficits and now we see with the Conservatives they have no problem with deficits either because uh, Andrew Scheer's promising a balanced budget within five years but he, as Maxine Bernier said last night during the debate, you're campaigning for a four-year mandate. So the balanced budget is not going to happen before the, the next next election. Yeah. Um, so, what should we watch for, Kim, uh, when as these as these platforms come out? I think for for the Conservatives, as as Bill has has already said, we're we're looking for where they make up that gap in terms of the costing. So, how do they actually balance the budget and fund the things they promise to do? And 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 that will be, I think, um, that, uh, I'm sure we'll have more to talk about about yeah. that later. But. Um, you know, we'll also just looking at where they, how, I, I will be interested to see when Andrew Scheer makes the announcement where he puts his emphasis, what he's tr how he tries to talk about where he sees those cuts coming from and, and what he plans to do. So just interested yeah. to see how, what he wants to emphasize. But it's fair to say, Bill, that the, the Liberals are waiting to be able to pounce on the idea that, and I'm going to use what has become almost a trademark phrase for Justin Trudeau, like Doug Ford in Ontario, Andrew Scheer is going to cut, 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 right? Yeah, yeah. Right, right off the bat from this campaign, it was all about Doug Ford. As you mentioned, he, Justin Trudeau would mention Doug Ford more often than he would Andrew Scheer because the uh, Doug Ford platform, he didn't have a whole lot of detail when he campaigned. And then once in office, there were some spending cuts that created some controversy. So uh, that's, that's been the Liberal message, and they haven't had the details from the Conservatives in order to really go after them. So uh, presumably once they get this document in their hands, they're going to find the parts that they think fit that, that message and go after them. Okay, we are standing by for Andrew Scheer to begin speaking in Sawasan, British Columbia. So there's a look at the lectern where he will be addressing Canadians about his platform in just minutes from now. It was scheduled to begin in the last few minutes, but as you know, these campaign events don't always run on precise uh, timing. Uh, they're kind of like budget deficits that way. Uh, so you can forgive them a few minutes uh, here and there. So in the meantime, we're going to get back to your phone calls, and uh, we might have to jump in and interrupt you if Andrew Shear starts speaking. But let's take a call from uh, Kay in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Kay, go ahead. Hi. Hi. Go ahead, Kay. Happy, happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Thank you. My birthday falls on that day as well. Okay. Well, happy birthday. Thank you. Um, the reason I am calling in, sorry, it, my voice is a little rusty. I've come down with a little bit of a stomach flu or something. Um, the taxes. Like, my husband is a trucker. And we trucked together for years. And the taxes, like, he makes about fourteen to $1,700 every two weeks for one of the largest trucking companies. They're based out of uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta. But here in Saskatchewan, whenever I go over his pay, they they put down like his miles and everything that he pays out, right? And the taxes that come off him are like $800. Right. Like that. Yeah, which would be a combination of income tax, uh, CPP, yeah. EI. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that needs to be looked into. So you think taxes like, are too high? Is there anyone who is is speaking to you when they talk about that over the uh, has, has, over the course of this campaign? No, no. Okay. And I, I'm really like, like we moved away from uh, uh, New Brunswick to come out here to have a better life and to be able to. Um, you know, live. 
and we're barely making ends meet. The taxes are just outrageous. The cost of things are yeah. unbelievable. Well, I'm and sorry we to hear that, Kay. Thank you very much for your call. Hope you're feeling better. Uh, let's go now to a uh, call from Dave in St. Catharines, Ontario. Hello, Dave. Hi, Mark. How you doing? Good, thank you. You're the best, as I always say every time I talk to you. And Bill <laughs> and Kim and Mark, happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving Same to you. you. Same to you. All the best, all of you. You're all doing a great job. You know, it, this makes me, I have a crazy question. You probably will most likely heard it before. And all the individuals, with the exception of one, I mean, I would think that most representatives have representative um, candidates through Canada. How, I don't understand how that Quebec person is allowed just to talk on his behalf. And I think Sheer nailed him last night. He said, well, all you want to do is separate from Canada. I just want to hear my comment is, it drives me crazy. I'm not anti-Quebec, don't get me wrong. I was born in Montreal. But I don't know how somebody has the ability to, in fact, represent himself uh, on a platform that only has to do with Quebec. I, I'm, I'm confused. Pardon me, but I'm confused. Sure. No, I know there are a lot of people who have that reaction across the country uh, about why the leader of the Bloc Québécois would, uh, party that's only running candidates in one province uh, gets to appear in the national leaders' and I'm not anti-French, parce que je parle mais I can speak perfect French if I have to. But I, so I just no, I understand your point. Dave, thank so you very much for your Mark, call. You're, you're the best, Mark. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Mike is in Dalhousie, New Brunswick. Hello, Mike. Hello, how's she going? Good, thanks. Good, and happy uh, Thanksgiving, everybody. Same to you. Okay, so the lady a while ago from Saskatchewan in that left New Brunswick, she wants to see what real taxes are. Like, she just moved back here. You know, she likes it. Okay, Mike, I'm having trouble uh, hearing you. I don't know if you can speak more directly into the phone. but I, 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 Yes, the okay. lady who moved away from here and uh, from New Brunswick there, she should come back here. She wants to see what real taxes are like. If she, if she wants to see what real taxes are like. Yes, and uh, the Quebec thing, uh, it's just a 152-year-old running scam. You know, somebody should just tell them, well, goodbye, and don't slam the door. They'd never leave because of the... <laughs> They only have English Canada to protect them. They're like a, they're like a big kindergarten kids. There. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. Okay. And as far as what I would like to see in the conservative platform, I would like to see more money for national defense and a more robust foreign uh, policy and help for our veterans. Okay, Mike, thank you. Let's go to Richard in Halifax. Hello, Richard. Oh, this is the first time I've managed to get through to anyone. Okay, well, we appreciate uh, your call. I have a question. It doesn't relate to the Conservative Party in particular. Uh, basically, uh, I'm concerned that more and more young people are not getting involved in voting. And I think that one of the reasons is, is that we've... We've, t we've spent so many years thinking of, of young people as just being kids. You know, we've forgotten. Uh, at 16 years old, a young person can drive. They can go out and, and be in control of a vehicle on the highway. Uh, they can join uh, the militia. They can, they can do many things. Uh, they can also go to work and be taxed and there's something that, to me that's wrong where you can have a, a young person who pays tax but has no representation do you think we should lower the voting age i think we should lower the voting age to 16 right if 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 we're if we're talking about young people not getting involved and not being aware some of the smartest people that i've ever come across are 16, 17, and 18 years old, you know, and it, it just, it, it irks me to no end that, they, as I say, they can drive, they can go out, they can go to work, they can pay tax, but they cannot choose the party in power that might uh, represent their interests. Sure. 
You know, it, yeah. it, it's, it's, just, it's not right. Okay, thank you very much for your call. The NDP, of course, are uh, proposing this bill that uh, that there would, they would lower the voting age. Um, so uh, we've heard lots of talk about electoral reform before, <laughs> and uh, not a lot has changed, of course. So we'll see. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's go to Lawrence in Chetwin, British Columbia. Hello, Lawrence. Uh, yeah, I've been trying to get through. I, I've watched the uh, the comments, not from the leaders and different ones, and. The one thing I've noticed, there, there's not very much uh, talked about veterans. Now, over the years, we've had 30-plus-some petitions in the House of Commons, and every party there has turned a deaf and blind ear to it and put us in the, uh, the path of forgetfulness. Now, Great Britain, New Zealand, and uh, Australia have all waived a moratorium of five years and gone back to the 40s and so honored their veterans with a volunteer medal. This medal has nothing to do with being overseas or now. It's for the volunteer service to Canada. And I'm, I, I would like to know if any of these leaders have got the courage to stand up in the House of Commons, bring back our petition off the table, and say, yes, we will create this medal again and honor our veterans as they should be. Now, it wouldn't cost them very much because the veterans went together and pooled money and had the dies made, the medal made, the ribbons made, so everything's made. All they have to do is turn around and say, yes, all past and present veterans would get this. Because right now, the way it is, I cannot see myself voting for a party because the way veterans are treated, they're taking away benefits, they're cutting back benefits up for the veterans, and it's a slap in the face. We signed up, and I signed up, when I signed up, I got $86 a month, and that was to put my life, possibly put my life on the line. And I've done two UN tours, three years in Europe, and various postings through Canada in my career. And I would like to know if the, the party leaders have got the backbone and the courage to stand up and honor and recognize the veterans like they should be. Okay, well, thank you for raising that, and thank you for your service to our country. Thank you. Thank you for your call. Um, so we're, we're standing by for Andrew Shear. Again, we expected this to begin uh, about 15 minutes ago, and uh, they're still doing some setup at the lectern in British Columbia where Shear is expected to speak. There you can see it. Uh, very picturesque setting, uh, and uh, we'll see what Andrew Shear has to say within minutes, we expect. We'll go there live here on CPAC as soon as he begins to talk, and at that point uh, we'll be able to tell you more about what is in the Conservative platform. Uh, we asked the question earlier, who has momentum going into the final 10 days of the campaign. Kim, what do you think about that? Who, do, who, do, who has the momentum right now? That's interesting. Uh, it's starting to feel like in, in Quebec, at least, the, the bloc has some momentum, yep. um, which, uh, which will have an impact on both the Conservatives and uh, clearly the, the NDP is not that, it, it looks still with the polls, not that likely to make, um, to do very well in Quebec, uh, despite Jagmeet Singh's strong efforts to try to win some more Quebecers over. Um, but uh, but for both the Conservatives and, and the Liberals, that'll that'll cause a little bit of pain. Mm -hmm. um, and and otherwise, you know, um, d despite what I just said about Jagmeet Singh, he he has shown some momentum in the last little while, um, kind of reaching a little bit more of his stride in the debates and and coming across as a better communicator. I, I would say. Yeah, Bill, what do you think? And uh, is is the rise of the Bloc Québécois going to cost? Uh, the Liberals a majority in, in the end? Do you think it makes it harder to get a majority for anybody? Yeah, it certainly makes it. The general thinking is that as the bloc goes up, at first they eat into Conservative votes, and if they keep going higher in their Quebec totals, then it starts hurting uh, Liberal ridings. But I think, especially with this election, because you've got the bloc, which is higher than they've been the last couple of elections, and the Green is higher than normal, I think we should all put our crystal balls uh, in the closet because <laughs> it's very hard to make predictions right. when you've got such splits it becomes so complicated because yeah you don't exactly know. I mean yeah. you, you could win a riding with 28 percent of the vote because yeah. of splits so 
Uh, the regions are so different. Uh, I saw some regional splits had the greens up in like 15% in the Maritimes, which is unusual. So, the, you know, those provincial breakdowns too also have a high margin of error. So a huge grain of salt needs to be taken when you're reading these these polls because yeah. also there's there's different factions of pollsters too. Some mm -hmm. have the conservatives ahead and mm -hmm. some have the liberals slightly ahead. So. So who knows what's going yeah, on? Yeah, and you just don't know where the votes are. It's not yeah. a, it isn't about the popular vote in the end. It's where right. the votes actually are located. So uh, we'll see. Uh, let's go to Karen in Regina. Hello, Karen. Hello. Hi, go ahead. Good, thanks. Happy Thanksgiving. Same to you. Uh, I'm calling in um, in regards to Trudeau was in for four years, right? And nothing has changed. Nothing. I mean, other, other than the taxes, the carbon taxes and things like that. Instead of things getting better, things are getting worse. So what is the conservative government? I'm for con the conservatives, but I'm wondering, what is Andrew Scheer going to do in the four years that Trudeau was not able to do? Well, that's a fair question, and I think uh, the Conservatives are hoping the answer is in their campaign platform. I, you know, we could we could list off some of the things that Andrew Scheer has promised to do. Uh, all of that information is is uh, available on the Conservative website. Um, you know, uh, I appreciate the call, Karen. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, it is it's there are differences obviously between the directions these parties are going to take. They're not incredibly stark differences uh, as elections go, and as and even if you were to compare Canada to other countries where there are some pretty dramatic gaps between the parties, uh, Canadian political parties and their platforms tend to be very close to the center, uh, don't they? Absolutely, and I think we've seen even some almost echoing of, of very similar right. promises. Similar Matching tax, tax cut cuts. for tax cut that's and so right. on, yeah. But I think there is a difference. When you get the platforms and you add up all the numbers, that's when the, the differences between the parties really seem pretty stark. And so the Conservatives generally would be the smaller government advocates, so their platforms will add up to a certain number. The Liberals over four years, they're talking about over 50 billion in promises. The NDP platform, over four years is 130 billion in spending and tax cuts. Uh, sorry, not tax, tax hikes to pay for the spending. Right. Then the Greens are closer to 300 billion. So there is a there's you know as much as you yeah. think that the the NDP and the Greens are the similar on a lot of issues, the Green platform is twice as large in terms of spending and tax increases than the NDP platform. Yeah. All right. Cornelius is in Winkler, British Columbia. Hello, Cornelius. Hello. Hello. Hi. Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead, okay. Cornelius. Uh, yes, I started talking about uh, these uh, ongoing deficits, you know, that uh, Trudeau has been rolling up, and yeah. uh, uh, he doesn't want to uh, balance a budget at any time. And, in fact, he says the budget balances itself. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, and I started off by saying Pierre Elliott Trudeau ran a whole string of deficits, and, uh, and as a result, in the 1980s, interest rates went up to 20 and 24 percent, and people lost their houses. Okay, thank you for your so, call. Cynthia, Cynthia in Calgary. Hello, Cynthia. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you for taking my call. Hello. Thank you for calling. I am... Um, have a question in the debate certainly and and other all the leaders are seem to talk about or it keeps coming up the 3400 jobs in quebec that are in jeopardy or were lost but not one leader including mr Shear, talks about the tens of thousands of jobs that were lost in alberta and of the high employment that is still going on in alberta yes they talk about pipelines but no one is really talking about alberta and all of the people that are out of work and have lost jobs. There are businesses closing all the time. So what are they going to do about that? Okay. Cynthia, thank you for your call. Um, is, it, is the reason that the leaders aren't talking about Alberta because Alberta is not a battleground in this election? Is that what it comes down to? It's, it's, it's I mean, that's probably, cynical, but, yeah, but uh, is that the case? Yeah, I think, um, I, I, I mean, Andrew Shear will talk about um, 
about energy issues to the right. extent that he thinks that he has a better chance of building a pipeline or an energy energy corridor, as he calls it, through um, when he when he talks uh, about it in Quebec. But um, they, uh, in terms of um, uh, of jobs in Alberta, more specifically, you're right. It's, it probably isn't coming up a lot because the focus is more on pocketbook issues for people in other parts right. of the country. Bill? Yeah, I think when the dust settles after this campaign, there'll be a lot of people expressing that sentiment in Western Canada, especially in Alberta, that, that their issues didn't really resonate in this campaign, that a lot of parties were happy for probably strategic reasons to not worry too much about uh, the energy sector and focus on other issues. Okay, let's go to Rick in Brantford, Ontario. Hello, Rick. Hi. Uh, hi. hi, Mark. How are you? Good, thanks. Good. Um, I wanted to give you a quick rundown on my impressions of uh, each of the leaders, and uh, I'll leave it at that once I'm done. Sure. Uh, Mr. Trudeau, uh, I've, I've noticed there's scandal after scandal. I can't really see that he's, you know, a, a leader-type quality because of, he seems to be out of touch and, and awfully rude. Now, Mr. Singh... Uh, I get the impression he's like Santa Claus and Robin Hood all in one. Like He wants to run a $32.7 billion deficit, and that'll ruin us completely. Uh, Elizabeth May, I, she's like, the sky is falling. Like We only produce 1.6% of the carbon in the world. Now, if we don't have the rest of the world involved in this, uh, all we're going to do is really hurt ourselves. She's talking about getting rid of gasoline and uh, diesel engines, and now I'm thinking $150,000 carb uh, uh, tractors and combines for the farmers. They can't run on batteries and stuff like that. And finally, Mr. Shear there, I think he realizes that Wynn and McGinty have made Ontario broke we're in such a hole and people must understand that we got to live within our means and we can't live off a credit card because we're paying massive spending on just the interest on the on, on what we owe if we could get back to a balanced budget why here in ontario and, and across the, the whole country then we'd be in much better shape because we could take that money and actually spend it on programs. That's about what I've got to say. Okay, thank you very much for your call. Uh, we've just gotten an update from British Columbia where they are now saying Andrew Scheer will begin speaking at 3.40 Eastern Time, 12.40 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, so that's in less than 15 minutes from now. He was originally scheduled to begin speaking at 3 o'clock Eastern, noon Pacific. So uh, we're in a bit of a holding pattern waiting for Andrew Scheer to unveil the Conservative budget, but we are interested in your opinions about the budget and about other topics arising during this federal election campaign. Ten days left to go, no more debates. We're into the final stretch here, and uh, uh, the the parable of Canadian politics, especially now that we have fixed election dates in October, is that Canadians gather on the Thanksgiving weekend and talk about politics and decide who to vote for and emerge from thanks to the Thanksgiving uh, long weekend with their minds made up. And that's when we see changes in the polls. And uh, that leads us to a conclusion in the election. Uh, it would be interesting if that happened this time around, uh, Bill, because... Uh, we haven't seen a lot of movement over the course of this campaign. It's been, uh, you know, in that, for both the Conservatives and the Liberals, it's been sort of in that 32 to 35 percent range almost since day one. Yeah, and the, the key is to watch, especially with the, uh, the Liberals, the NDP and the Greens, because the Conservative vote tends to be pretty rock solid. It, uh, it's the others that's kind of like to jump between camps and... Uh, they tend to jump to whoever, whoever they think is the front runner. So, you know, you forget uh, two elections ago, the Liberals only had about 30 some seats and the NDP was way out ahead of them. And then that flipped last time. So um, that's that's the battle that's playing out in the next few days here is those people who switch between those three parties. Where do they finally hang right. their hat? Uh, what do you expect in the final 10 days, Kim? What are some of the things to watch for here? I think, um, you know, We'll be watching for after after uh, the Conservatives bring out their yeah. costed platform, some of the what's in there and some of the attacks that will likely come from the other parties, from the Liberals in particular, on where the cuts are coming from. I think um, you know we'll watch for 
especially now that now that the debates are done and the platforms are out there, there's there's not much more in the way of specific announcements the parties are going to be making. So it it's um, will be interesting to see how um, who the different parties go after where they think that they're going to see some risks. So for example, last night and, and more recently we've seen the Liberals go after the NDP a little bit more, um, which I think speaks to what Bill mm -hmm. was just saying about where, where they see some risk of, of the vote moving away from. Yeah, we'll also see where they go and spend their time, mm -hmm. right, which is another indicator. Yeah, there was talk this morning, <clears throat> Justin Trudeau's first event was downtown Ottawa. So a lot of, there was a lot of speculation. Is that just because he was here for the debates right. and it's easy? or? Yeah. Or is Catherine McKenna, the cabinet minister in Ottawa Centre, who won this riding from the NDP, you know, are the Liberals worried about that riding? Is the NDP challenging? So that's the kind of thing that happens when a leader stops off in a defensive riding as opposed to an offensive riding. Right. Now, having said that, I think he's on his way to Burnaby uh, next, where it, he's going to campaign in Jagmeet Singh's riding, right? So All right. And, and Sven Robinson's running in that area too, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, we'll see if he goes on the offensive there. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, let's take a call from Monica in Burlington, Ontario. Hello, Monica. Hello. Hi, go ahead. Hi. I am um, um, happy Thanksgiving to everyone. And the same to you. Thank you. I would like to speak about uh, the pension plan, uh, retiree pension plan, and uh, the, the situation with cost of living went up many times uh, over the property taxes are going up and after um, I am a migrant as most of Canadian people are and uh, after about 37 years my husband got 900 I believe 30 dollars of uh, that the Canada pension plus the old age pension and now with all the taxes and uh, somehow this got completely omitted that uh, these people, the retirees, they have to live, but not at that cost when everything goes up, and including taxes that we've been paying over so many years. But the retirement pension plan it just is probably from like 70s. So how that was never mentioned in, in any on the platform or any issues, and I was wondering if that would ever be uh, addressed. So I'm not sure what you're specifically referring to. Bill, do you, do you have an answer but here? Just generally on the issue of seniors' benefits, that's certainly a topic that a lot of the leaders are addressing in different ways, so I think all of them have a, a version of it. Uh, the Conservatives are promising a reduction in the, uh, uh, increase in the benefit from the age credit, so that'll benefit seniors. The Liberals are promising uh, increased CPP benefits starting at age 75, and the NDP and Greens are putting a lot in their platform for pharmacare, uh, so that would be uh, obviously of benefit to seniors okay. from their meds. Yeah. Age of 75, that's a joke. That, that's the age that most, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's okay. Yeah, but that's the age that most of the seniors have issues and they're gone. So that's a joke that you have to wait at the age of 75 to, to be able to collect some, some uh, support. Okay, Monica, thank you for your call. You're Appreciate welcome. It. Let's go to Bob in Chilliwack, British Columbia. Hello, Bob. Oh, hello. How are you guys? Good, thank you. Well, I have to tell you, I, I did do the advance poll this morning, and what kind of uh, finished it for me, I, ha I have to tell you, I avoided the two uh, main parties because they both agreed that they were going to uh, appeal the decision that Cindy Blackstock managed to pull out of the courts. And uh, that did it for me, so I sort of did a bit of a protest vote. And, of course, I'm in a safe riding. It won't have much of an impact. But it's just um, those are the little things that sort of bug me in the bigger picture. Like a previous caller, uh, where have veterans been? Uh, like the lady that just uh, phoned you, the taxation is at the wrong level. It, it's at the working class level. The caller before uh, a couple of callers ago said the same thing. My husband is driving a truck, and you're pulling eight hundred dollars per pay period out of us. It's like, and and yet, corporate wealth in this country is staggering, despite the shape of the rest of the economy. It, and I hate to say it, but when the macro economy looks good, it seems everybody that gets their fingernails seems to uh, do a little bit worse, like the spike in homelessness and changes in the market as far as shelter costs are concerned versus what's available. We still need those. It, we, it's like we never seem to quite get it right, if you know what I mean. But anyway, I, I sort of did a protest vote and, and got it over with, and that was the reason. I, I can imagine um, 
Cindy Blackstock and Pam Palmer, the two of them, if they ever got in a room together and watched some of these debates and, and after they got the news of that court uh, ruling uh, appeal, you know, they just must have been shaking their heads and say, will these guys ever, ever get it right? It seems every time they, they, they get an inch gain on some kind of a repair and repair what it is, because we are the beneficiaries of all the displacement and all the, uh, the things we did to destroy these people, so we are responsible because we are benefiting. You know, they just must shake their heads and say, wonder when would these guys ever go? So those things, so veterans weren't top of mind. Uh, First Peoples, again, sort of got swept aside in the mix of things. And, uh, you know, so it was kind of a, I did a discouraged vote, if you will. Hmm. So sorry about that being negative, but it's, and happy Thanksgiving anyway. But I just, hmm. it just, I didn't feel very good in it. I was undecided which way to pick until I went in there. But I, but that reason was enough for me to avoid the two mainline parties. Just okay. Last decision. Yeah. Fair enough, Bob. Okay. Thank sorry. you. Thanks. Thanks for your call. Nicholas is in Edmonton. Hello, Nicholas. Hello there. Hi. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I I think that the uh, conservatives are gaining a lot of momentum and. Uh, so from that perspective, there is one area that uh, hasn't seen enough investment, and, and that is in uh, banana cream pies to uh, hit those uh, conservatives in the face when they come to visit Alberta. Okay. Uh, thank you for your call. We uh, have some comments on social media. Let's take a look at uh, some of what uh, some of the uh, comments from people who are sharing their uh, views with the hashtag vote 2019 we're asking you what should be in the conservative platform. Arthur writes, only neoliberals go on and on about costed platforms. People need medicine. People need dental care. I'm not going to deny them either because some almost conservative thinks there's no money to pay for it until they see some balance sheet. Hashtag priorities. Patrick writes, well over 100,000 votes were cast by students across Canada in polls that closed yesterday, all of them without the benefit of having seen fully costed platforms from all federal parties. How do you feel about that? And this person writes, disappointed the NDP chose to release their costed platform on the same late date as the Conservatives. I know the strategy, can't be questioned on it during the debate, but in past the NDP has usually been better than the Conservatives on this. Let's go to Robert in Calgary. Hello, Robert. Yes, thank you for taking my call. I'm really disappointed in this election here because I, as an Albertan, believe in the pipeline to go through. Plus, our MP in Calgary Shepherd, Thomas Kimmick, does not like us people in East Side Calgary of our views because we've stated our views with that, with that MP. And he, he is not for us. We all we want is better education for our people, employment, better pensions for our seniors, and we need respect, not disrespect, from either the Conservatives, the Liberals, the NDP, and the Green Party. So the thing is, my support will go to the PPC party, and as long as I'm alive in this city of Calgary and Alberta, I'll keep changing my vote or whatever party is out there that I agree with, as when it comes to provincial, I'll support the Alberta party. When it comes to provincial politics, and when it comes to federal, I'll support the PPC. If they don't do any good, I'll keep switching my vote until I find a party that resonates with the people like myself in East Calgary. And I'm calling okay. from Dover and in Forest Lawn. But I want to thank, thank you very much for bringing on this program. Thank you for Bye. your call. Carolyn in Brandon, Manitoba. Hello, Carolyn. Hi. Hi, go ahead. Well, I'm a little concerned about how Trudeau has separated the whole com country. We've got the West that nobody really cares about because it's not just Alberta. It's Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and northern B.C. And then you got the Quebec separatists rising like what has he done he's hurt canada he's embarrassed just on the global stage like i don't get it i don't get why mainstream media keeps knocking conservatives down and that's i'm disgusted it's turning me right off okay carolyn thank you 
Thank you for your call. Thanks. Vincent in Toronto. Hello, Vincent. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. Good. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to sort of make a note uh, to the people, to the voters of, uh, of this nation, to maybe think a little bit about uh, the broader strokes, like uh, what, and concentrate a little bit more on what's good for the country, not not so much about like what what a, the leader is going to do for me, uh, kind of thing. So, because I just think that federal politics are about bigger issues and not about like identifying like. And I think this is part of what the problem has been with the Trudeau government is that they're trying to individualize and uh, compartmentalize people into groups and and whatnot. So I think just this broader stroke. Uh, thinking just might be a little more beneficial to, you know, uh, just to, to uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, like I, just to make a better decision, I guess, is what right. I'm trying to get to. Yeah. And then uh, I guess just the last part would be asking your panel there about what they feel about how the media is uh, um, representing all parties. Do you think it's even in... Uh, Balanced, or do they think that there's a there's a bias in the media? So you want people from the media to comment on whether there's a bias in the media? Uh, the panel that you have with yeah. you there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can I can guess what their answers are going to be. Um, I, <laughs> you know, if you have a comment on that, I welcome it. Although I you know I I want the focus of have your say to be on the election campaign and on the parties that, you know, this is a wide open forum where people can say whatever they want. And I want the, uh, that, that should be the unfiltered conversation that we're having about the election, not about the media's performance during the election campaign. Right. I think, well, it's in terms of just the, the People's Party being so under um, represented in the media, I think is a bit of a problem. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the, the challenge is what if, if we're, you know, where do you draw the line between what parties get coverage and what parties don't? There's, there are other, there are 16 parties that are registered with Elections Canada. And, right. uh, and you know, the, the People's Party has never elected a member of parliament uh, before. Uh, so that puts them in the same category as the Marijuana Party, the Marxist-Leninist Party, the Communist Party, the Libertarian Party, the Rhinoceros Party, and so on. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not disparaging them, uh, but I'm just saying you you know decisions have to be made and about where you're going to uh, uh, deploy your resources and what's of most interest to Canadians, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay thank you. Enough, so thank you for your call. Was, yeah. okay. Let's take another look at uh, what's happening in British Columbia, where we are expecting within minutes, Andrew Shear will begin speaking. The Conservative leader uh, is about to take the lectern. There, you can see that there are. Supporters gathered. Uh, the human backdrop is uh, being assembled now and being put in place, as has become the custom in, in uh, at political events now. That is not Andrew Shear, of course. That is uh, somebody who's getting things set up so that Shear can take the microphone. While we're waiting for that, let's go to Paul in Saskatoon. Hello, Paul. Hello. Oh. Hi. I'd like, I'd like to uh, basically register my disappointment with uh, very little discussion on where actually wealth is generated or how wealth is generated in Canada. There's been a lot of talk about the billions and billions of proposed spending to raise, uh, to, uh, to spend on social programs, etc., by certainly the left-wing parties without any recognition or even any understanding of what actually drives wealth generation, i.e., including large corporations, small businesses. This is where... Wealth is generated where, where money is made, and uh, there seems to be no recognition or understanding of that. Okay, uh, that's a fair point. I mean, I think that needs to be part of the discussion. Uh, Paul, thank you very much for your call. We have a couple of emails as well. Let's take a look at what people are saying at have your say at cpac.ca. Natalie writes, what about million Anglophone Quebecers that have no representation? Will the bloc represent us too? The Greens and NDP are also running openly separatist candidates. Had NDP in our rural agricultural riding the last eight years, but bus services stopped. No access to healthcare education. No one's talking about real issues. And Gary writes, I do feel the NDP are gaining momentum. The Liberal Party is losing momentum and everybody else's status quo. I have one question that I would like the politicians to answer. 
and that is if we are all driving electric vehicles in the next five years, who will be paying for the road infrastructure that the gas tax used to go towards? I hope that is costed in their platforms. We appreciate your emails. Again, you can email us at haveyoursay at cpac.ca. Let's go to Eric in Montreal. Hello, Eric. Hi, people. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Like uh, I tell, I want to tell people in the West, we, the, we support the, the pipelines, regardless what even the media says in some ways. Also, we want to talk about the equalization formula. We want to really want to put kind of back in track. And some ways, even I, I noticed in your, the, in your panels because I watched the English and French panels, even they organize their debates. Why it always it have to do with the Bloc Québécois in representing even Quebec? Even Quebec, uh, it's part of this way. Quebec is pretty very good people, but they're intelligent people, but not because the way it always present that it's like one thing they say in Quebec in the French side, and one thing they say in our thing in English Canada. So, like in terms of that, it's like I, I think like. The discussion is like uh, if really want to put in fair, it's like why not bring like the real in the, in the people like uh, fairs in the different different districts and not like uh, just telling about like have to do it by the main media or what uh, sometimes even they tend to preference between the liberals, the conservatives, even in Quebec, it's like the Bloc Québécois or the conservatives or the liberals with the same status quo. Even I don't get it. Why people in Canada? Then to say, okay, the NDP is the solve the problems. You know, there's the Communist Party with our colors, you know? Okay, Eric, thank you. Claudette in Kitchener, Ontario. Hello, Claudette. Good afternoon, folks, Hi. and uh, happy Thanksgiving. Same to you. Uh, I'm just going to run through my short list very quickly, and I'll just then leave it with you. Okay, I am a conservative, and this is what I have found under Trudeau. 60 billion overseas, along with millions to the UN, for his popularity. Yet he treats our military and First Nations horribly. Environment, he flies two planes. International embarrassment, which has caused an enormous loss of trade. His past scandals as a teacher and his blackface scandal. He's a liar, he's immature, he's the worst pre uh, prime minister ever in our history. And the other thing I just cannot get over, how can you pay your bills if you're causing hundreds of thousands to be employed? Now, Mr. Shear, the last thing I have to tell you, you damn well better keep your promises because I've had it. Thank you. Thank you for your call. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about the debate last night while we're waiting for Andrew Scheer to begin speaking in British Columbia. Um, do you think anything changed as a result of that debate, uh, Bill? Well, I think anybody who watched it would come away far more informed than they would from the English language debate. It was much better in terms of a format. Uh, there was a lot less talking over. For those who haven't seen it, they were broken off into groups of three. So there weren't six at a time, only, only in rare circumstances they go six at a time. So there's less talking over. And so I think every, all six of them had the opportunity to give people a reasonable sense of where they stood. So you know, I don't think there was any dramatic uh, knockouts or heated exchanges, but it was actually a decent display of where all the parties stand and what the people are like. Yeah. They brought out some of the journalists to to give some sort of some rapid fire questions to each of the mm -hmm. uh, candidates, which I think, uh, as Bill said, I'm not sure we got anything really specific out of that, but it really put each of them on the spot to answer for some some things that have been up in in the air and in a in a quick and efficient manner. So, um, you know, I think it, it was a really effective uh, debate. They also the, that spotlight that they had, they they mm -hmm. brought right. in a couple yeah. of times. <laughs> Uh, Something Trudeau a little was, bit game showish about it that. It was a but, little bit game showish, but, uh, yeah. but I do think it worked. But it worked, worked. yeah. And uh, th there was one point when tr when the, um, Mr. Trudeau was not part of the group debating, but he was attacked on a particular thing, and they put the spotlight back on him, brought him back in to <laughs> answer, turned it back off again, and, you know, it, it, it kept them in line. So uh, there will be some discussion at the right time, obviously, Bill, about the format of these debates and... and uh, what the takeaways are and what we need to do differently next time, I'm sure. Well, and we're hearing that from the callers too, some frustration yeah. from English Canada, particularly about the presence of the Bloc Québécois. I think uh, 
questions should be asked. You know, you set the threshold at running in more than one province, and then there's no Bloc Québécois MP on the English debate. I think there's a lot of frustration that with the six people uh, in the English debate. But th then we did see in the French debate, it wasn't necessarily the number six that was the problem. It was uh, there are you can still have six people and have a decent debate, and you're seeing that in the U.S. too, where sometimes they'll have democratic debates with 12 people on the stage and they're sure. not shouting at each other and you can still it's it can be managed with a lot of people but um, you know it's been an issue the last few elections with the, the Green Party in particular what are the, what's the threshold for so sometimes Elizabeth May's in sometimes she's not uh, it's so so arbitrary how do you define these things it was interesting with the rules for Maxim Bernier that comes up a lot in the yeah. callers mm -hmm. they had this criteria of I think you had to meet two out of three thresholds and one yep. was proving that you're competitive in five ridings. And so you actually had the commission run by our former governor general hiring Frank Graves and Ecos to do polling and Nipissing and five hundred five yeah. specific ridings to make the case that they're competitive. So it's, it was yeah, and, uh, you know, I wonder if if a potential solution is to have national debates and then have regional debates too, right? So mm -hmm. you could have a debate that's just about Quebec issues, and you invite the bloc to that one. Uh, but does it make sense to have the bloc at a debate where it's in English and it's uh, for the whole country, right? Right, and I think you can definitely make an argument that there are other regions of Canada that deserve that kind of focus yeah. that Quebec ended up getting by having two French language debates that naturally included some very yeah. Quebec specific questions. And presumably the parties could choose for themselves who represents them at some of these debates. If you mm -hmm. if you decide you as the leader want to go to the Quebec debate or you want to go to the Alberta debate, great. If you've got a candidate in Alberta that you want to, to, mm -hmm. to carry the baton for that debate, you could do that. So I think there are lots of options. Uh, but it does feel as though this time around the debates were a lot more similar to what we've had in the past than people expected when this debate commission mm -hmm. was struck. I think the ideal too would be to lock everybody mm -hmm. in early on, like the first year after an election, because what happens is you get six months out from a campaign and whoever thinks that there's an advantage to being in more debates or less sure. debates, they start gaming the system, they yeah. try to find It's hard for the parties not to make decisions based on their own electoral self-interest exactly, yeah. when it's so close to the election. Right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. All right, Robert in Rockridge, Manitoba. Hello, Robert. Robert, go ahead. That's uh, line one, Robert in Rockridge, Manitoba. Hello. Hello. Hi, go ahead. I uh, just want a, a comment about uh, uh, which leader is uh, better or what, whatever. But my, my call is, my call, the reason why I'm calling, I'm asking all the First Nations to vote this time, this time, of, this time to vote uh, which party to go to. So my point is, Mr. Trudeau has been good to us, all the First Nations, even water, they, they, they build water and housing, and they're giving housing, and that's the way we want a person to work, to recognize us too as First Nations, where are the First Nations of, the, of, of this world, might as well say it. So my point is, I ask all the First Nations to, to vote, to vote uh, which, which party you satisfy what well, I'm satisfied I never phone here I never I never but it, I make up my mind last night after debate they have Mr. Trudeau was good good on that debate so my point is uh, we're going to support him us anyway uh, there's a PC riding here in Rockridge a, a MP from Dauphin we never see him around here uh, all these years he's been there about two terms already, but we never see him to come around in the communities okay. like that. Robert, I'm going to jump in because Andrew Scheer, thank okay. you for your call. Andrew Scheer, the Conservative leader, is now going to speak in Sawasan, British Columbia. Let's go there live. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, very much for joining me here today as I unveil our platform, my plan to help you get ahead. And unlike Justin Trudeau's so-called plan, this has been fully costed by the Parliamentary Budget Officer. This is a fully costed platform with all the numbers. Now, throughout this campaign and throughout my travels, I've been constantly reminded that Canadians are truly the most fortunate people in the world. We are the keepers of a proud history 
We have fought and helped to defeat forces of tyranny and helped to bring peace around the world. We are the protectors of a rich democracy, one rooted in a commitment to pluralism, personal freedom, and individual responsibility. We are the stewards of breathtaking natural beauty from right here on the Pacific to the Arctic and to the Atlantic. I believe Canada's potential is as vast as the distance between our shores, and I believe our best days yet are still ahead. But we have to change course now. Four years ago, Justin Trudeau came to office on a promise of sunny ways and positive politics. He spoke of his hopeful vision for the future. But it didn't take long for his professed optimism to give way to outright cynicism, for his commitment to unity to dissolve into divisiveness. The last four years have clearly demonstrated that Justin Trudeau is not as advertised. He said he would be accountable and ethical. Instead, he has used the power of his office to reward his supporters and punish his critics. He said he would help the middle class. Instead, he raised taxes on 80% of middle class Canadians and imposed a carbon tax that's making everyday life more expensive. He said he would balance the budget. Instead, he's running massive deficits that threaten higher taxes and important social programs like health care. Under Justin Trudeau, Canadians are working harder and harder, but they're just not getting ahead. And I hear it everywhere I go. Everything is getting more and more expensive. There's less and less money left at the end of the month. Your goals are getting further out of reach, and you're falling further and further behind. But I'm here today to say that better days are coming. And that on October 21st, you'll have the chance to end Justin Trudeau's cover-ups, deficits and tax hikes, and elect a conservative government that will finally help you get ahead. Throughout the campaign, I have announced several new ways my government will lower taxes and put more money in the pockets of Canadians. And today I want to highlight what that will mean for three different families many Canadians will be able to relate to. Consider the example of a retired couple living right here in Tawasson. Under our Conservative plan, they will get $2,580 back in their pocket every year to help them get ahead. Ou l'exemple d'une famille de quatre bientôt cinq à Montréal. À la fin de l'année, un nouveau gouvernement conservateur aura remis 4642 dollars dans ses poches. Or the example of a family of four, soon to be five, in Montreal. A new Conservative government will put $4,642 back into their pockets. And one final example, a family of four in Markham. Each year, this family will have $3,264 more to put towards its future. We're the only party with a plan focused on you and on your needs. We're going to start by scrapping the Trudeau carbon tax that is making everyday essentials more expensive for Canadian families. If Justin Trudeau is re-elected, gasoline is going to go up 31 cents a litre, while the average cost of natural gas for a Canadian household is going to increase by $469. A new Conservative government will also introduce the universal tax cut, saving a couple earning average salaries $850. We will take the GST off of home heating costs, saving your family over $100 a year. We will introduce the Green Public Transit Tax Credit, saving a family of four who take transit up to $1,000. We'll make maternity benefits tax-free, putting up to $4,215 back in the pockets of new parents. We will introduce the Children's Fitness Tax Credit, allowing parents to claim up to $1,000 for sports activities. We'll also introduce the Children's Arts and Learning Tax Credit, letting parents claim up to $500 for arts and learning programs. We'll expand the age credit, benefiting the lowest income Canadians the most and giving a senior couple up to $300 back. We'll boost government matching to RESPs by 50%, helping parents get more for their kids' education. And we'll introduce the Green Home Renovation Tax Credit, putting up to $3,800 back in their pockets, in the pockets of families doing their bit to fight climate change by making their homes more energy efficient. Justin Trudeau a passé sa campagne à dire aux Canadiens et aux Canadiennes que tout va bien. Et peut-être que c'est le cas dans son monde à lui. Je suis sûr que les gens qui n'ont jamais dû se préoccuper de l'argent ne s'inquiètent pas du, du prix de l'essence, de leur facture d'hydro 
ou de leur hypothèque. Mais je suis ici pour les gens qui ont besoin de souffler. Les gens qui font tout, aller à l'université, trouver un bon travail, travailler fort, payer leurs factures à temps, mais qui n'arrivent pas à améliorer leur quotidien. Dans les espoirs, les rêves sont toujours plus loin. Les parents qui discutent le soir, comme les miens le faisaient souvent, dans une maison de ville dans le sud d'Ottawa, pour savoir comment ils vont tenir jusqu'à la fin du mois. Notre plateforme conservatrice est pleine de mesures concrètes qui vont aider les familles canadiennes à épargner et à planifier pour l'avenir. Et contrairement à Justin Trudeau, nous savons combien ces mesures coûtent et d'où va venir l'argent. Justin Trudeau, on the other hand, has spent this campaign telling Canadians how great everything is going. And perhaps in his world it is. I have no doubt that people who have never had to worry about money aren't concerned over the high price of gasoline or the utility bill or their mortgage rate. But I'm here for the people who just need a break. The people who are doing everything right, going to university, getting a good job, working hard, paying their bills on time, but who still can't seem to get ahead in life whose hopes and dreams keep getting further and further away. The parents who sit around the dinner table, like mine often did in a townhouse in South Ottawa, stressing over how they will make it to the end of the month. Our conservative platform is full of real, concrete measures that will help Canadian families save and plan for the future. And unlike Justin Trudeau, we know how much it will cost and where the money is going to come from. Our platform has been verified by Dr. Jack Mintz, President's Fellow at the University of Calgary School of Public Policy, who says this fiscal plan is reasonably estimated, resulting in a budgetary balance in five years. Our goal this election is clear, a new Conservative government that empowers Canadians to build a brighter future. This in itself is a worthy goal, but ultimately it's part of a larger vision. Canada's success depends on Canadians' success, and Justin Trudeau's small, petty vision of Canada, of region against region, province against province, and Canadian against Canadian is unworthy of this great country. We will return to the optimism and vision of Canada's greatest leaders, dreamers like Sir John A. Macdonald, unifiers like Sir Wilfrid Laurier, and builders like John Diefenbaker. Un nouveau gouvernement conservateur va rassembler notre pays d'un océan à l'autre pour réussir quelque chose de grand. Un pays prospère qui offre des possibilités à ceux qui les recherchent. Un pays pacifique qui laisse les gens prier, penser et parler librement. Un pays plus fort et plus uni, digne de ceux qui sont venus avant nous et qui méritent nos enfants et petits-enfants. En tant que Canadiens et Canadiennes, nous devons commencer à voir grande et nous devons le faire ensemble. Le potentiel de notre pays est illimité. Nous avons tout pour réussir. Il nous faut un gouvernement qui nous permette de le faire, pas un gouvernement qui nous écrase. This election is about the future of your family and the future of our country. A new conservative government will bring our country together from coast to coast in pursuit of something bigger than ourselves. A prosperous country that offers opportunity to all who seek it. A peaceful country that allows people to worship, think, and speak freely. A stronger, more united country, worthy of those who came before us, and that our children and grandchildren deserve. As Canadians, I want us to start dreaming big again. I want us to start dreaming together. We can be a country of yes again. Yes to big ideas, yes to big projects that create prosperity and bring our country closer together. Our country's potential truly is boundless. We have everything we need to succeed. What we need is a government that empowers us, not diminishes us. This election is about the future, of your family and the future of our country. And the choice is between a Justin Trudeau-led government that divides Canadians for short-term political gains and a new Conservative government that brings Canadians together. The choice between a Justin Trudeau-led government that favours its well-connected friends and a new Conservative government that works for all Canadians. The choice between a Justin Trudeau-led government that cuts deals for the millionaires who run billion-dollar companies and gives massive, massive exemptions to the largest emitters and a new Conservative government that puts everyday Canadians first. The choice between a Justin Trudeau-led government that makes life more expensive and a new Conservative government that will make life more affordable. C'est le moment, chers amis. C'est le moment de tourner la page sur quatre ans de négativité et fausses promesses. Et tant que Canadiens et Canadiennes, nous devons regarder vers l'avenir avec confiance et optimisme.
C'est le temps du nouveau gouvernement conservateur qui va vivre selon ses moyens et mettre plus d'argent dans vos poches pour que vous et votre famille et le Canada puissiez améliorer votre quotidien. So the time has come, my friends. It's time to turn the page on four years of negativity and broken promises. As Canadians, it's time for us to look to the future once again with confidence and optimism. It's time for a new Conservative government that will live within its means, put more money in your pockets, so you and your family, and ultimately Canada, can get ahead. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Happy to take your questions. Hello, Mr. Shear. My name is Annie Bergeron Oliver, and I'm with CTV National News. Economists are predicting a growth in the economy beginning in 2020, and many are concerned about a recession in the coming few years. Your plan to balance in 2024 does rely on reduced interest payments to help get you to balance, especially in the last few years. Do you believe that there is enough buffer built in, and what happens if you don't form a, a second majority government? Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely, I do believe there's enough buffer built in. This is a responsible plan with. Uh, uh, prudent framework and uh, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, we believe that it's much better to have Canadians tax dollars going into better services or f freeing up space for the government to cut taxes than to be paying interest on the debt. And under the Liberal plan, more and more of your tax dollars are going to pay just interest on the debt. Their plan doesn't give us any, any flexibility if we do head into a, def a difficult situation, ours does. Oui, alors notre plan est un plan prudent et responsable et c'est mieux d'avoir l'argent des, des contribuables euh, aller euh, aux, euh, aux meilleurs services ou pour les, euh, les baisses d'impôts que de payer les intérêts sur la dette pour, euh, à les banques. Alors ça, c'est un plan prudent et responsable. Et avec le plan libéral, qui n'ont pas des chiffres, euh, on n'a aucune flexibilité s'il y a une, une période euh, économique difficile dans l'avenir. On a separate subject, your party is proposing $50 million over five years to a national strategy on autism. I'm wondering if you can go into a bit more detail about what, would this, what this would include and what types of new treatments might be available for people who do have autism. Mm -hmm. Well, this is about developing that exact strategy and bringing experts together, as well as those responsible for provincial uh, health departments to uh, develop strategies for enhanced care, uh, for uh, best practices and, uh, and things of that nature. Uh, so this is a, a, a way the government can play a leadership role in bringing all of those stakeholders together, parents as well, to determine the best way forward to make sure that children with autism have the very best care and have the best possibility uh, to maximize their potential and, and, uh, and, and, and to get the help they need. Bonjour, M. Scheer, Philippe-Vincent Foisy de Radio-Canada. Um, sur Netflix, vous décidez d'imposer le 3 Par contre, il n'y a pas de taxe de vente. Un des arguments que vous avez dit dans le passé, c'était que ça prenait de l'équité fiscale. Là, Netflix et les plateformes n'auront toujours pas de TPS, tandis que les Canadiens, elles, les, les plateformes canadiennes, elles, vont devoir encore collecter la TPS. Mm -hmm. Alors, euh, j'ai dit en passé que euh, c'est le temps pour avoir une revue de notre système de taxes. Euh, c'est clair que plus en plus de, de, des échanges euh, sont sur les plateformes numériques. Il y a beaucoup des, euh, des inéquitudes dans, dans notre euh, économie à ce moment. Alors, c'est l'intention de notre gouvernement de regarder cette, euh, cet aspect-là. Mais aujourd'hui, on parle de taxer les géants de web pour assurer qu'ils paient leur, euh, leur part. Si ils ramassent les milliards de dollars de l'économie du Canada, il faut qu'ils euh, payent leur part. À quel point le choix est clair sur l'équilibre budgétaire? Parce que vous avez parlé du choix tantôt. Vous voulez dire aux Canadiens qu'il y a un choix entre des déficits et un choix entre la rigueur et donc un équilibre en cinq ans. C'est ça le choix? Ça, c'est la responsabilité. Ça, c'est un plan responsable. On va protéger les services publics. On va continuer d'augmenter. Et je sais qu'aujourd'hui, les libéraux vont essayer de créer la peur. On va maintenir l'investissement, les augmentations pour les services, pour la santé et pour l'éducation, les programmes sociaux comme ça. C'est essentiel qu'on ait un gouvernement qui arrête d'emprunter l'argent de, des contribuables et de leurs futurs contribuables et paye plus en plus d'argent pour l'intérêt 
sur la dette. Avec le plan de Justin Trudeau, on va, ne on va jamais équilibrer le budget. On va emprunter année après année après année. Ça, c'est inconcevable. Ça, c'est irresponsable. Il n'y a aucune personne au Canada, il n'y a aucune famille qui pense que ça, c'est euh, une meilleure une, une, une façon de vivre pour leur, euh, pour leur propre famille ou pour leur propre entreprise. On doit avoir la responsabilité pour le gouvernement. Ça, c'est un choix très, très clair. Aucun équilibre, aucun équilibre budgétaire avec les libéraux, un plan responsable avec les conservateurs. Hi, Mr. Scheer. Melanie Woods, HuffPost Canada. Uh, in the platform, in your leadership platform, you talk about restricting grant funding to universities that don't commit to free speech policies. And we've seen the Chicago principles adopted by provincial governments in Alberta and Ontario. How will universities you know, pass the test at the federal level? Well, thank you very much for the question. I'm very proud of that aspect in our in our platform. Uh, there are uh, threats to free speech uh, all over the world and uh, and in here at home as well. And that is why we will have a regime put in place that prioritizes federal spending, federal grant contributions to universities that have uh, taken concrete measures to protect free speech on campus. There are a number of different models that we are looking at. Uh, this will be done in conjunction with university officials. I've already started uh, some of those consultations as leader of the opposition. We'll continue those as government and ensure that students have uh, the, the, the knowledge and the confidence that free speech is protected on campus. And kind of as a follow-up, I know a lot of the kind of criticism of policies like the Chicago Principles has been around human rights legislation, existing human rights legislation. For example, in BC, LGBTQ folks are protected against harassment and discrimination on campuses. So would Banning a anti-trans speaker from campus, for example, put a university at risk for funding. As I said, the, the goal of this program is to ensure that legitimate debate can be held. Uh, we've seen phenomena all over the world where uh, where, where where people are not able to uh, uh, to speak, where uh, events have been cancelled, uh, not because they violate uh, uh, any particular code of conduct or university policy, but just simply because uh, people protested and then there are uh, concerns raised about security and things like that. So the goal here. Is is to protect robust discussion, robust debate, uh, and, uh, and of course universities have the right and the obligation to uh, ensure that uh, uh, students can, can take their studies in, in security and without uh, be a fear of uh, harassment. Uh, but we also have to make sure that, especially on university campuses, which were founded to have those challenging uh, ideas challenged and, and robust uh, debate, uh, that that can continue in Canada. Hi, Mr. Scheer. Uh, David Cochran with CBC News. You've got about $49 billion in tax cuts and spending over five years in this plan. And to get pay for that and get rid of the deficits, about $67 billion in cuts in new revenue and delayed infrastructure spending. What do you say to the people who look at the $53 billion in infrastructure delays and cuts and say you can't do this without slashing programs and, and cutting jobs? Well, because we've shown exactly where the money's come from. Uh, we are committed to increasing the transfer payments for health education and social programs. That is a, a guarantee that that is costed and is outlined in this platform. Uh, we've said where we're going to get the money from. We're going to get it from corporate welfare. We're going to get it from foreign aid, from countries, uh, relatively well-off countries that don't need uh, Canadian taxpayers' dollars. We're also going to eliminate things like March Madness, uh, where government departments spend hundreds of millions of dollars in the dying days of the fiscal year. Uh, we're going to in, uh, make sure that government real estate is allocated responsibly so that the government isn't wasting money uh, with empty office uh, space uh, all over the country. Uh, we're going to protect core services while we make government more efficient. Uh, liberals measure success in government by how much money they spend. Conservatives measure success in government by actually getting results. And it's essential that we do this because the choice is clear. If we do not get back to a, a responsible plan for sp treating Canadian taxpayers' dollars wisely, we will see those massive deficits threaten social programs and lead to massive tax hikes. This is the time that we can get back on track and avoid the Kathleen Wynne disastrous situation that Ontarians know all too well and that Canadians across the country have seen. In your... Yeah, in French, please. please. Uh, alors, nous avons euh, déjà montré où on va épargner l'argent. On va couper le sou les subventions corporatives. On va éliminer 25 des d'aides étrangères. Et on va éliminer les choses comme March Madness, euh, où les départements fédéraux dépensent les millions et millions de dollars, les cent centaines de millions de dollars, et euh, les, euh, les édifices vides et les choses comme ça. On va maintenir, on va protéger l'investissement pour la santé et l'éducation. Mais c'est essentiel qu'on on, on a un plan responsable pour arrêter les grands déficits année par année par année. Ça, c'est 
est responsable. Et est la, la, cette chemin va toujours la même direction, la, la même euh, termination avec les, euh, les systèmes sociaux, les services sociaux menacés et les augmentations des taxes. And, and Mr. Scheer, starting next year, right away, you're going to start pushing off billions of infrastructure spending into the future to help you balance the budget. But a lot of that infrastructure money would be uh, tied up in programs where there are agreements with provinces or with municipalities on multi-year funding going forward. So how do you expect them to respond to this sudden jolt of, of cash moving out of the, the next five fiscal years? Uh, I, I, I obviously uh, reject the, the, uh, uh, the description of that. Uh, what we know and what the parliamentary budget officer has said is that the Liberal government has no plan when it comes to infrastructure. Uh, they, they, uh, the, most years they lapse up to 40 percent of the money that was earmarked. Uh, projects aren't getting built. And so what we're saying is we're going to send this, the same amount of money and we're going to do it in a responsible way. We're going to respect all existing agreements for projects that have already been signed off on. We're going to see those through and we're going to put in place a responsible plan that actually gets money out the door and shovels in the ground. And, uh, and, and that is clearly not, not, what, not what is happening. And the Liberals, again, will try to create fear where, where, and, and, and division over something that is simply not true. This is, uh, they, their infrastructure plan has been a disaster. It has been widely uh, condemned by fiscal experts and by municipal experts who are saying that it's not leading to the increased uh, economic activity and the increased projects. So we're going to keep the total amount of spending over a responsible period of time so we stop borrowing billions and billions of dollars from taxpayers. Oui. Alors, euh, on va euh, euh, garantir tous les projets qui sont déjà euh, commencés, qui a déjà eu une, une entente entre les différents niveaux du gouvernement, et on va dépenser le même montant d'argent dans une manière plus responsable. Et le directeur parlementaire budgétaire a dit que le plan libéral n'existe pas. Et chaque année, le gouvernement laisse à peu près 40 d'argent sur la table, pas pour les projets, pas pour commencer les projets. Alors, avec ce plan, les municipalités, les maires peuvent avoir confiance qu'ils peuvent continuer de faire les investissements dans les grands projets um, et on va assurer qu'on arrête les pratiques d'emprunter les milliards de dollars des contribuables. I should just mention on that, on the, on the question of existing projects, we have made specific commitments uh, that we're already getting tremendous feedback from not just municipal leaders, but also people who live in communities, uh, like the Massey Tunnel replacement uh, here in BC, and like the expansion to the Ontario and Young Line in Toronto. So it's quite clear that with us, with the Conservative Party, you actually get big projects going. Uh, you don't just get uh, uh, what the Liberals say, which are false promises without the shovels in the ground. Uh, Ian Bailey, Globe and Mail. I wonder if you could circle back to infrastructure. Given, <clears throat> given all the infrastructure needs, especially here in the Lower Mainland, why spend less? Why spend $18 billion? It's not about less over five years. It's not about spending less. The total amount of spending continues at the same overall level. And we have to keep in mind, these are at record high levels. The previous Conservative government spent billions of dollars increased spending on infrastructure to get these important projects built. And our plan maintains that uh, overall budget amount. So again, the Liberals are going to try to say things that just aren't true. And I will take no lessons from a party that hasn't even costed their own platform. They're now going to try to cost our platform when they can't even provide cost for their platform. So I'm not going to listen to anything that they're going to be saying today on our on our numbers. And a follow-up on that. I mean, the, the, the promises of not being costed for some of these projects, so how will they get built while overall funding is kind of cut? Isn't there some uncertainty there? Well, again, I, I reject the premise. The, 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 this is a, an overall budget envelope that will, con that, that will continue to be maintained. The overall dollar amount is the exact same. There's no reduction in the overall dollar amount. What we're saying is that we are going to make sure that projects actually get built. And that's what the Liberal government has failed to do. The parliamentary budget officer said their plan didn't exist, that the projects aren't getting built, the money's not getting out the door. So we're going to make sure the money that does get, that actually goes out the door and gets these projects built. Thank you very much. Oui. Alors, euh, 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 le, le directeur parlementaire budgétaire a dit qu'il n'y a aucun plan, que les projets ne commencent pas et euh, qu'il n'y a aucun euh, bénéfice économique avec le plan libéral, pas, pas un vrai euh, bénéfice économique avec le plan libéral. Notre plan va actuellement euh, réaliser les grands projets pour euh, aider, le, 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 pour améliorer la qualité de vie pour les gens dans les communautés partout au Canada. 
Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Andrew Lawton from True North. So your plan calls for balanced budget legislation, which seems to be based on the premise that a government can every year balance the budget barring unforeseen circumstances. Why then commit future governments to something that you're not prepared to do for five years? Well, it's an, uh, we have a lot of work to do to clean up the Liberal mess. And uh, we want to do it in a way that can allow uh, existing core services to, uh, to, 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 to be strengthened. We're going to increase those investments in health care, education, and social programs by at least 3% every year uh, while controlling the growth of government spending in other areas and by eliminating wasteful practices like March Madness, uh, the public, uh, the government hiring outside consultants, spending hundreds of millions of dollars on outside consultants when they have expert public servants who could do the job within the federal departments, and of course uh, uh, by ensuring that government real estate is managed much more efficiently. And on the note of immigration, how are you going to, under a conservative government, deal with the tens of thousands of asylum seekers that have already come in illegally who are denied their claims and thus not eligible to stay? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, just this week I made an announcement at Roxham Road where we've seen tens of thousands of people cross into Canada illegally, and I made the announcement that we would close the loophole in the Safe Third Country Agreement. We would also increase resources for uh, our border service agents so that they can carry out uh, judicial decisions and, and decisions by, uh, by those who are hearing those applications, and by increasing the number of, uh, ju of, of judges who are hearing uh, the cases in the first place. Mr. Shea, this is Manpreet, and I'm from Red FM. Now, as you know, there are less than nine days left in the elections, and we are already in the, on 11th of this, we are all in the advanced polling stage. Mm. Don't you think you're too late to announce your platform? And my question is, is it a part of your strategy, or was it because of the pressure from your federal opponents, who've been often asking you, you've been delaying it? Uh, not at all. This was always the day that we had decided we would unveil our platform. And quite frankly, it was because we had so many good things to announce throughout this campaign. Uh, even just yesterday, we announced uh, further measures for helping those who are uh, adopting children. Uh, even though uh, it, was, uh, it was the day before the advanced polls, we still had great policies to announce. In fact, there's some policies in this platform that because uh, we have so many great ideas, we weren't able to get them all out before the platform launched, but I'll be highlighting them uh, next week. Thank you. Andy Blatchford, uh, Canadian Press. Uh, Mr. Shear, I was wondering which specific economic data points will tell you that your overall plan is working? Uh, for example, what are your targets for employment numbers, wages, GDP growth? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we're going to be looking at all of those things. Uh, as we implement this plan, we know that Canadians' uh, purchasing power will increase when they have more money put in their pockets. Uh, we, we can expect a GDP growth as a result of, uh, of these measures. More money in people's pockets means more money at their disposal uh, to, uh, to invest in their homes, to uh, invest in their children, uh, to, to basically spend as they see fit. And that's the biggest difference between Liberals and Conservatives. Uh, conservatives believe that the dollar left in the hands of the hardworking taxpayer who earned it is always better spent than in the hands of the politician who taxed it. So of course we'll be looking at things like uh, GDP growth and employment numbers, and we believe that this is a much more responsible plan than endless deficits. Endless deficits that mean higher taxes. And when taxes go up to pay interest on debt, that is not good for the economy. En français aussi. Oui, alors on va regarder tous les chiffres comme le, le uh, GDP et les, uh, le, les, uh, les, les taux de, des emplois. Et on, nous sommes confiants que quand on laisse l'argent dans les poches des Canadiens, ça, ça c'est mieux pour l'économie que quand le gouvernement doit augmenter les impôts pour payer l'intérêt sur le dette. I had a question for you about the cyberbullying uh, element of, of your plan. Um, would it enable parents, uh, sorry, people to sue parents and guardians of cyberbullies, and how effective uh, would this really be? Well, as a father of five kids, I think we can all agree that we're entering into, uh, you know, a new territory when it comes to how our children uh, interact with each other. And uh, I know I've spoken to parents whose uh, children have had to switch schools because of bullying, and a lot of it is happening online now. So what this measure is about is about starting the work to create a framework to protect kids and to give parents the tools they need and to have some ac accountability uh, for when, uh, when, when tragedies happen and when uh, when. Children's are, children are forced to change schools or go through uh, mental illness or anxiety because of the, the treatment that they've had online. This is about starting the work to create a framework around that to protect kids and give parents the tools they need. 
en français aussi. Oui, alors on va commencer. Comme une paire de cinq enfants, j'ai je, euh, je, mes, mes propres inquiétudes avec euh, le, euh, les, les, les plateformes sociaux. Et euh, je sais, j'ai parlé avec les autres parents où, euh, et qu'il y a des enfants qui ont dû changer l'école parce qu'elle était le, le victime de le cyberbullying. Alors, cette, cette euh, idée, c'est de commencer le travail de, pour créer une régie autour. On peut protéger les enfants et donner euh, les outils aux parents. Hi, Mr. Shear. This is Shelley Hagen with Bloomberg News. What would you do if the global economy slows down sharply? Would you abandon the balanced budget? The concerns that many are raising about the uh, potential global downturn is precisely why we have to get back on track now. Uh, we c Justin Trudeau has spent our way out of having any type of flexibility if there is a downturn. Those massive deficits are weighing down our economy. It means more and more money has to be taken out of the economy uh, through either borrowing by the government, which takes money out of the economy, uh, or by paying higher interest payments on the debt, which is just going to banks and bondholders. Uh, it's precisely because there are some uh, signs of possible headwinds that we need to get back on track. We need to turn the ship away from the rocky shoals and back out to clear waters. And that's exactly what this plan does. Oui, alors c'est clair que les grands déficits euh, va nuire la capacité de l'économie du Canada d'être proté d'être capable de gérer les conséquences d'une une récession potentielle. C'est la raison pour laquelle on doit régler la, 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 les, les grands déficits. Et notre plan est un plan responsable qui arrête d'emprunter de, 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 l'argent de l'économie et arrête de réduire le, le montant que le gouvernement doit payer pour l'intérêt to the debt. Money spent on interest on the debt is wasted money. It is, it, is, it is going to banks and bondholders. That money could be going into better services or into tax cuts. And that is the difference. That is the clear choice here. Canadians can now see an irresponsible liberal plan that will run massive deficits for years and years and years. And we all know what happens when that is allowed to continue. It means threatened public services. It means higher taxes. It means life getting more and more expensive, and Canadians will fall further and further behind. Or they can choose the Conservative plan, which protects core services and increases investments in health care, education and social programs, but gets back to balanced budgets so we can stop wasting taxpayers' money on interest charges on the debt. And regarding the plan to eliminate the tax gap, if it is feasible, why hasn't it been done yet? Well, it, it, it takes, it takes uh, a government that has the purpose of mind to do it. Uh, this Liberal government spent their past four years going after small business owners, calling them tax cheats, all the while protecting those who have uh, offshore uh, accounts and, uh, and, and, and things of that nature. So they made their choice. They thought that the local pizza, owner, uh, pizza shop owner and the local mechanic were cheating on their taxes. Uh, we believed that they were creating jobs and opportunities in their community. So we're going to go after those who are not paying their fair share of taxes, eliminating the tax gap while lowering taxes on our job creators and people who create uh, businesses in our local communities. Martin McMahon with News 1130. Um, about $14.5 billion of these cuts for five years falls under the category of operating expenses, other operating expenses reductions. Could you just expand a little bit on, yeah. on what that means? Yeah, thank you very much. Yes. So um, I'll, I'll give you one example. Uh, recently, uh, we filed a request for information from the government on what's known in Ottawa as March Madness. And that is when government departments, uh, if they have leftover money, instead of returning it back to the, the, the taxpayer and leaving it there for, uh, for, uh, for, for future years, blow it all at the end of the fiscal year. And uh, we asked the government how much money was spent, what were the types of items that were purchased in that period of time. And the response came back, and it was hundreds and hundreds of pages of examples. So March Madness is one. We're going to put it into that practice. Uh, we're going to stop the practice, or, 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 or at least target the practice, of outside consultants being brought into departments at exorbitant rates when we have expertise within the public service. This is something that public service unions have actually flagged, uh, where you have 
people with expertise within a department available to do the types of works that outside consultants are paid to come in and do. And we're going to rationalize uh, federal real estate. We have so many office buildings all throughout the country that are not being fully maximized, not utilized properly, which means that we're paying far more uh, for real estate uh, than we would otherwise need to. So those are the examples that we're using to show that we can protect core services and protect employment levels within the public service, but stop the practice of, uh, of, of blowing money out the door in the, in the last few days of the fiscal year. Alors, on va éliminer le phénomène euh, qui, se, qui, qui, qui était appelé euh, le March Madness, où les départements fédéraux dépensent euh, beaucoup d'argent dans les derniers jours de l'année la, fiscale. On va éliminer, euh, réduire les pratiques de, pour les consultants euh, qui viennent dans un département et euh, qui ch chargent des dépenses euh, euh, énormes. Quand on a des euh, fonctionnaires avec l'expérience et la capacité de faire la même chose, et on va rach rationaliser euh, les... les uh, les édifices uh, fédéraux. The word recession has been seemingly absent from this campaign from, from all the parties, but, but your platform does mention that word. And yet, as, as one of my colleagues pointed out, there does seem to be this sort of self-handcuffing on the idea of not being willing to run deficits in during, you know, times of economic difficulty. So in one sense, your party seems to be the lone one to sort of appreciate the clouds on the horizon and yet you're also handcuffing yourself with this this plan of we will not run deficits under any circumstances and as you know um, I don't think anyone would question Stephen Harper's credentials but during times of real economic turmoil he did run deficits so mm -hmm. for some people certainly economists watching this they're probably going to look at it and wonder if there's a bit of a contradiction here what would you say to people who who would point out that well, uh, I, first of all, we're going to take steps within this pl platform and within our mandate that will strengthen Canada's economic activity. Uh, under Justin Trudeau's government, we've seen tens of billions of dollars of foreign direct investment leave Canada. Uh, they've, uh, the, the investors have pulled money out of Canada because we can't get build big things built in this country. So by getting big energy projects back on track, by implementing a national energy corridor, we're going to see uh, a great deal of economic activity linked to that. Leaving money in the pockets of Canadians. Helping them get ahead also helps the economy. When they're able to spend money on the things that are important to them, that creates economic growth much better than when the government is spending money for them. And again, getting back to balanced budgets gives us more flexibility. Reducing the amount of money that we spend on interest charges frees that up, frees that up precisely for uh, if there are headwinds in front of us. And, you know, the Liberals have to explain to Canadians if they spend money quickly when times are tough and they spend money quickly when times are good, when do they ever get back to balanced budgets? When do we ever get to the point where we stop spending money on those interest charges? The answer with the Liberals is never, and the answer with us is in a responsible period of time, five years, getting back to balanced budgets, protecting core services and lowering taxes, putting money back in the pockets of Canadians all across, the, all, all along the way. Will there be any exemption in any scenario where a government can run a deficit under your legislation? Well, the, the, uh, the, the, with our legislation, uh, we will ensure that government has to find the money for new types of programs. If they are going to, uh, you know, embark on new spending uh, initiatives, they have to find the money for that. That is how Canadian families live their lives. That is how Canadian businesses live their lives. And it's time that we had some fiscal responsibility at the federal level as well. Thank Thanks very much, everyone. Hello again, I'm Peter Van Dusen, and we have been listening to Conservative leader Andrew Scheer as, uh, in British Columbia as he unveils his party's costed election platform now with just 10 days to go uh, before the vote. You heard him talk about a number of ways on how they're planning to raise uh, revenue and how they're planning to cut uh, spending, and uh, that's all uh, over the next four or five years in this uh, document released by Andrew Scheer.